Hey there, I would like to thank some folks at the start of the episode, people like Red Minjo, Alex Zook, Nicholas Pryor, Kat Zimmerman, and Tyler Hughes. All of these are people who have gone to patreon.com slash duckvtv and helped us out. You can be like them and support us by going to patreon.com slash duckvtv. Also, want to let you know our new show, Best Quality Vacuum, which is about the Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul series. That is now available at uh, bestqualityvacuum.net or in your podcast directory of choice. Go listen to episode zero, and if you can, leave us a rating or review. That helps us a lot in these early weeks. Thank you. My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Watch Out for Fireballs Dispatch, our monthly Q&A topics, listener response episode. Yeah, we are here. Going to A, your cues, and then also read your responses to September's Mm. games, uh, Bug Snacks, Metal Gear Solid 5, and uh, Carrion. Uh, yeah, boy, lots of folks wrote in about Metal Gear Solid Five. <laughs> not, not surprising. Not surprising. Uh, this is this is a weird admin note, and I'm going to make it weird. I'm going to Streisand effect something. Oh, okay. Uh, I I was having exceedingly strong head fog, fog during the Carrion episode. Okay, it was weird night and day. Like after the next day, I felt like a different person. Okay. So just get, like pretend like during that episode, if you're listening back, and you're like, man, Gary is rambling a lot, and just. <laughs> Yeah, like imagine I was on bath salts or something. Okay, uh, because I I I was just head fogging it up. It was pretty incredible. I if I had felt that way a couple of days in a row, I would have been worried. Right. You know, I thought I was just tired, but then it persisted for the rest of the day, and it seems better now. But I would say instead yeah. of imagine I was on bath salts, I would say imagine that Gary just about a month ago had a really bad case of COVID and it everybody, everybody yeah. gets, you know, everybody gets a little bit of extra leniency, let's say. Yeah. Imagine that I'd taken a bath. <laughs> <laughs> imagine that uh, filthy fat fuck uh, well i mean I, if, yeah. you, if you said i t- i just took a bath i would assume that you had taken some time to relax sit yeah. in the tub I, I would assume that it would be supplemental to the usual showers you would think so yeah one yeah. imagines one imagines uh but yeah just uh just throwing that out there uh i i feel like i was not at the top of my game during yeah. that uh not a big deal don't want to make a huge deal out of it but you know i acknowledge it yeah uh, bad brain. Um, yeah, we're here to, to answer your questions and then we'll also, uh, announce November's slate. It's crop crop. We got a crop ahead of us. It is a crop. We got, we got crop for the end of the year. We got cool stuff in January. Can't wait mm-hmm. to do it. Q4. Uh, I will get us started here with Matt. Uh, Matt says, I just finished playing Stray. When considering what I liked about it, I found it evoked a similar emotional response to me as Soma and Nier Automata. I realized that any type of media with bad, broken robots is entirely my shit. Can you please recommend me some sad, broken robot stuff? Also, what aesthetics or themes have you realized you're 100% down for no matter what? I think an example that's come up on the network often is people turning to dark gods or malevolent forces because they actually work. Are there any other examples? Yeah. Uh, so the thing is, you just named the two really good games about sad robots that I know. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, I just did a I did a search on TV tropes, and they're trying to say that the Mega Man X series is about sad robots. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. No. Um, uh, there's some good stuff in Virtue's Last Reward about that. Uh, that is that comes with a huge caveat that you have to be down for some zero escape bullshit, but it's mm-hmm. there. It's there if you want it. You know, yeah. Not not so much sad broken robots, but there's uh like AIs and and such uh that that have personalities and struggles in um Tacoma. Oh, Tacoma is a great game for that. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, I, typically it's not a trope that I care about mm-hmm. as much as, as a lot of people, like it doesn't capture my heart. So I haven't, uh, sought out yeah. broken robots. I, it's, it's a machine. I, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's yeah. This goes more into the um uh kind of like cyberpunk realm, but it's about like neural implants and the perception of death as it is captured by computers that you relive. But there's a game by Bloober Team, uh a studio that I don't usually rec- recommend, but the like the one like slam dunk that they've had is called Observer, uh, mm-hmm. which is really good. Uh it's one of Rutger Hauer's last roles in anything. Aww. He plays the uh, plays the main character in that a detective uh, investigating his uh, his son's death in his apartment uh, complex that is on cyberpunk lockdown kind of stuff. Uh, it's real good. I, I would hmm. uh, I would say go ahead and do that. That's a, a fun cyberpunk sci fi horror game uh, that will uh, hit some of your soma hit some of your soma vibes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of tropes that, uh, you know, always in the pocket for, I'm sure that there are a bunch of them that are not immediately springing to mind, mm-hmm. you know, right now, like I want to just say cults, but that's really vague. Yes. You know, like there are a lot of things can be cults. Uh, I do love a cult, mm-hmm. but, um, I love going into a, uh, haunted house space. So like, and it's a showpiece space. Mm-hmm. So like the spoon collector from the the Witcher or the room full of chairs in Demon Souls, mm-hmm. like a room with unusual, but that's like a micro trope. Yeah. That isn't a narrative thing. It's just a visual I think is really good, great. Based on that, I could recommend an episode of FX's The League. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh I like everyone involved in that. Uh-huh. The the fantasy football angle like made it so I, I couldn't it, you know grasp onto it. I know it backseats it, but yeah, yeah. Well, they they should never have uh, front seated it. <laughs> I know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was I was able to effectively ignore it. Uh, yeah. Plus, also, like the references are so old that I don't actually feel bad. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I came to it so late that it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> Taffy's these people aren't playing anymore. Cool. It it's just abstract. <laughs> yeah, they may as well just be saying names. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is this is hard for me to say tropes because everything that I like uh, has been kind of in vogue recently, especially in the the horror space. So you know, if I said things like "oh, unreliable narrator" and "found footage" kind of stuff, that's just kind of like what everything is to the point where I feel like it's a bit oversaturated right now. Uh, kind kind, kind, mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know, just stuff in the VHS aesthetic kind of kind of deal. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit this one out. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the, there are a couple of good examples there. Yeah, uh, What does Alex have to say? Alex says, hi guys. Uh, I played XCOM 2 for the first time this year and then immediately played through it three more times. The doctor says I have inoperable tactics brain. You have know, my condolences. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy about it is its inverse difficulty curve. The game is at its most brutal in the first third. Uh, then steadily gets more manageable from there. Uh, This seems smart to me. As you end up in an unwinnable state, you'll probably only have to replay the beginning of the game, uh, and the toughest part of the game is also the part uh, that you play and practice the most. Uh, Can you think of many other games uh, that have a progression like this, and do you think more games would benefit from an unorthodox difficulty curve? Uh, There there are lots of games that uh, open up once you get... A, a little bit of time under your belt. Mm-hmm. Um, a real big example of this, and it's not a roguelike, or, or, you know, and XCOM 2 isn't either, but you are failing and restarting and stuff. But like my go to example for this is always uh, Baldur's Gate 1 and Divinity Original Sin, mm-hmm. uh, both of which don't start becoming like video, video games until you get like a level under your belt. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a few levels in Baldur's Gate's case, but they have uh, difficulty curves like that. Um, and in general, I don't know that I necessarily consider that super virtuous. Like I like it in, in Divinity Original Sin 2 mm-hmm. because it's demonstrating how powerful level ups are. Yes. You know, and to get around it early on, you have to really stretch your brain. Um, but it's not like, uh, the same thing that Alex is talking about where you are, it's very, very difficult to master at first. You yeah. know, that that's something I associate with like roguelikes. There are a lot of roguelikes that feel like that. Mm-hmm. You know, like Isaac has an inverted difficulty curve. When you first start playing it, like you're lucky to, you know, to beat 
beat mom, like beat the first boss. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like that is nothing, you know, once right. you have time under your belt. That's one of those things, too, where, like, subjectively it's very difficult, but that is also at the time where the possibility space is constrained the most. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not unlocked, you know, you don't have a whole lot of stuff unlocked, which is, um, like, having those things would be a benefit in a lot of ways. However, you know, that's also complexity that you have to keep under your head or keep under your yeah. hat and also uh, uh, kind of messes with the... Um, oh gosh like messes with the pickup you know randomization chance kind of you know, mm -hmm. kind of deal like the subjective difficulty at the start where it's not designed that way but effectively feels like it like that could apply to the souls series writ large right like yeah, me, yeah the first time i picked up dark souls spending you know 12 hours in the undead burg and then now i can you know just dash to the dash dash to the yeah, tourist even in five minutes it's nothing yeah yeah the, but the, it's also those games very specifically ramp up the difficulty in other ways to keep it yeah, a, of a pace. Like, it's really interesting the way those are designed to have trivial things lean on the, you know, that that new player difficulty mm -hmm. and then move from there. Yeah. You know, so when you replay it, like, that's why you can, like, you know, I can get Dan Orlando in 30 minutes if I want to. Yeah. Um, you know, because it, it's not, uh, it's actually quite easy. Mm -hmm. But then there are other things that keep you coming back. It's not, you're not just playing for challenge. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I would say, I would say strategy is where this, where this generally happens, you know, even though yeah. like, I don't know, something like Frostpunk, right. Where I would say anybody who sits down and plays that you're going to need to, you know, screw up your first run in order to start a yeah. second that'll, you know, that'll go just kind of because of the way that it's put together. Uh, but even that like gets objectively harder as it goes, as they throw more days of worse weather at you. Yeah. Can I, uh, add a wrinkle to existing duck feed lore real quick? Sure. Um, you know, you and I have forever feuded about this throughout the first pancake thing about the first pancake thing. Yeah. 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 That, that's a, that's a wedge issue for the two mm -hmm. of us. Um, splitting our base. Uh, I, I had this, this really phenomenal weekend. And one of the things I did, uh, as the, on yesterday, the last day of like long weekend was I went to a, uh, in Portland, a restaurant, a breakfast restaurant that has a griddle at the table and you can make your own pancakes. Okay. Uh, I might just be excellent at making pancakes. <laughs> oh, okay, like it could okay. be like just a, a literal, uh, you know, the part of the reason why I've never understood the throw out the first pancake thing. Uh -huh. At first I was like, it's wasting food, but I was like, it's never bad enough to like not eat. Uh -huh. And then I was making pancakes in front of, in front of Liv, my fiance. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, she's like, you're, you, you're really good at making pancakes. And okay, she doesn't, okay. you know, she's not just, you know, uh, saying nice things about me for no reason. Right. And I was like, maybe I just have an instinctual knowledge of this. And that's why that turn of phrase never made sense to me. Huh. I was born flapjacking. I came out of the womb with two spatulas in my hand. It was awful it's, for my mother. It's kind of like how I never understood the uh, the aphorism. It's the motion of the ocean, not the not the size of the boat, uh, because mm -hmm. I was born with a dick that could crack glass if you drop it on it. Yeah, so, yeah the kraken. Yeah, the kraken yeah. is what they call it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's exactly, exactly the, the same thing. Exactly yeah. the same thing. Really similar. Like if you can't relate to to small dick problems. <laughs> Like being good at pancakes, yeah. how would you? How, like, that, that requires a small dick solution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see. At our startup, we're revolutionizing, we're revolutionizing small dick problems. We're, we're, we're revolutionizing the tight the micro dick community <laughs> by creating tiny bowler hats. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway i i just like it might just be a thing like I, there's so many things i'm dog shit at uh-huh i'm i'm so garbage at a million things it might just be something that i'm good at and hey, that may be why i don't throw out pancakes i wouldn't take it from you yeah, yeah. i made pancakes a couple of weeks ago first time i went to pour batter was still a little bit too lumpy you don't want it to be like not lumpy uh mm -hmm. but uh it would just kind of just just kind of fell out of there it wasn't the right consistency and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. had to scrap that one start over toss it not start over, but, you know, just get the mixture right. <laughs> get a new stove and get a new. <laughs> uh, Jonathan says, uh, we're currently going through a round of video game shows and showcases. And I've got a question about the oh so devious hype. Gary, I know, is fond of saying kill the hype inside you, a concept I agree with, but I have a hard time executing. Uh, hype in general is an interesting thing to consider. 
Why does it affect so many so hard? What purpose does it serve beyond purely capitalistic ones, if any? Do you guys have any specific hype killing methods? Thanks a bunch for your work as always. And then there is a PS uh, about, I'm not going to read the whole thing because uh, it'd be a good response for Metal Gear. And we have a lot of those. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, basically to get the gist, don't worry, Gary, I'm a big mech nerd and I also found D Walker to be stupid to look at. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of shrugging about the mech nonsense in MGS5. Yeah, yeah. And saying even yeah. the idea that the, it has to have kids pilot it is not necessarily original. There is an entire yeah. Gundam series about it. And also, isn't that what Evangelion is, except with depression? The idea that that's been a plot point in multiple mecha mm-hmm. is so funny to me. Like, we can't make the chairs bigger. They have to be kids. <laughs> that is ham fisted and dumb, and I don't care what it's in. But right. I, yeah, no good. Yeah. Uh, as for the first one, you know, there are a lot of questions in there, but I, you know, like what purpose does, d- d- does hype serve? Honestly, a deleterious one, I, you know, mm-hmm. I think that like, uh, I, I'm not a developer. I've never released a game. I've never tried to communicate enthusiastic and enth- enthusiasm. Uh, let's, mm-hmm. let's hear it be a powerful enthusiasm for like a project that big. You know, so like I, I, I can't say that there's a subjective value. I would say that a non negligible part of any like actual creators, uh, like, uh, let's say affinity for hype around their own things is like, oh, this might sell well or, you know, conversely, a bunch of people might experience this, which are ultimately the kind of the same thing i think same hype, effect with different goals yeah, yeah i think the, the the only effect that hype gives is to diminish what you're going to uh experience because playing something collapses the possibility wave to, to one thing you know yeah there's a there's a weird kind of larger than life uh fun pretend mm-hmm. feeling that people uh experience in varying degrees you know so like for example as much as I get hyped, I was, you know, am and was very excited about Gloomwood, right? Yes. Gloomwood came out. Uh, it's early access. It's mostly done, but there's stuff they're adding. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played it. I didn't get to play it as much as I wanted, uh, but I, you know, I played it and it it's a really good immersive sim thief-like, mm-hmm. which is what I expected it to yeah. be. And that's good enough, mm-hmm. you know, but if I had spent all of the time I, since I knew it came out, just like rubbing my hands and licking my lips and just like watching every little piece of footage, it would have had to have been more than just a really good thief, like to me to work, you know, and that's, uh, it, it, I think it places an unfair expectation on games, which at the end of the day are going to be video games. And I think that like hype stuff is a big reason why, uh, you know that like we we video games can't be enough like why there's this hyperbolous uh swingy critical system of things that are either the best or the all-time worst mm-hmm. you know with stuff is because they kind of have to be if you really really look forward to them like you get into trouble yeah. uh hyping uh no man's sky is the big example of that if that had just been marketed as what it was mm-hmm. like in any better world what it was would have been good enough and would have just found an audience yeah you know, uh, but it's just not the economic realities that we live live under. You no. know, that is a very specific situation in which the marketing was pressured from the publisher. You mm-hmm. know, like the uh, so yeah, so it, I, I think it, it does a disservice to to the experiencer of hype and the way that uh, and the the motivation for it is to sell more copies or to economically succeed. Yes, uh, either for altruistic or you know capitalistic reasons, and that's just where we live that's the water Mm -hmm. like it sucks but i think people do have to do it yeah you know um i'm happier not participating in it yeah i think to kill the hype inside you all you have to do is have one particularly bad experience with getting overhyped about something in your past um and then realizing that uh you know uh like I say, the most powerful phrase in the world is that's none of my business. Second most powerful is I don't have to go on that ride. I don't have to go yeah. on the ride. You know what? They're trying to hype it. I'm not going to go on the ride <laughs> because I know it's going to make things suck. The most excited I get about something, you know, like pr- practically is I will see a reveal trailer at one of these events, which I watch or pay attention to. Generally, I like to keep up on stuff. And then if there's a release date added, I will add it to a special calendar that I have um, mm-hmm. and then uh, just uh, let it be. Yeah. 
just uh, so, so, some of you people never built a PC to Deus Ex Two Invisible War specs, and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, <laughs> you have to go back and like that that game is a perfect example that's a game i actually like mm-hmm. uh but it the hype was stupid that i had for it yeah uh if i just thought like actually this is going to be worse than deus ex but mm-hmm. still okay i would have been way happier yeah you know and and, and you know. it says some of you never uh spent an entire summer calling gamestop every day or it would have been bad bitches at the time uh, uh, to see if the game Mobile Suit Gundam Journey to Jabbero was released because oh. <laughs> you wanted to play a Gundam game because you recently yeah. got into Gundam as a uh, as a as a, as a, as a, as a tween. You ever yeah. make it to Jabbero? I have made it to Jabbero. It was underwhelming. Yeah. That's not a very yeah. good video game, Gary. <laughs> the uh, Jabbero man, <laughs> no good. <laughs> and take it from us. Yeah um yeah so just have one bad experience with it and uh yeah, just just know you're not helping yourself you're not helping the developer you're, you're not helping anybody no no uh doug says uh i was recently thinking about my favorite story flourishes in game writing not full-blown Shyamalan twists but rather little moments that add depth or color I recently finished Horizon Forbidden West and was reminded of the moment in Zero Dawn where they discuss soundproofing the lobby so people can't hear the screams from the next room over as people learned about the end of the world. Uh, that is a really good moment. That is, I like mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, the, that moment alone was a big factor in why I sponsored that episode. Are there any narrative touches like that which stand out uh, for you as enriching a game while not necessarily not, while not necessarily flipping the entire entire story over i what what i think about that is like specificity you know being the the soul of any good writing Mm -hmm. you know like the the way to express how a person is or what a situation is like what people are gonna be into is to find a really small lived in detail yeah um and uh what i feel like that detail is the other thing it's doing so it's that trick it's a, a very small detail rather than just saying it was really horrible. It was hard for people. Yeah. You take a practical concern and juxtapose it with something impractical and <laughs> like cosmological in scale. Right. You know, like, uh, like, Oh yeah, they would have to do this um, to make that work. You know, like little things that show that even in, you know, the face of the end of the world, you still have to make things work. Mm hmm. You know, like though that that dichotomy between big and small, yeah, uh, always really, really works to undersell the horror or drama or or anything like that to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even if it's something that is not um, uh, something that is not like small or incidental, like bringing a part of the story, like uh, what I like is when some little bit of flavor that is. You kind of find its way into the intrinsic mechanics of the game, but also underlines the theme. So uh, uh, that's my circuitous way of getting around to saying, I love that in pathologic, the entire economy uh, revolves around trading sharp things to children for uh, medicine um, and trading bottles of water to drunk people for sharp things. Yeah. Yeah. It just kind of shows the, the kind of the desolation of this place and how the, the actual order of things has completely broken down. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, just those kind of details are what you want. Like a, a shitty example of that, that would be like, uh, you know, in, in a, in a game that I don't think is very good in a better game, this would work. But like in Bioshock infinite, when they're like, send food, not bullets. Yes. You know, in the background, they overuse that. And the actual conflict in that game is as shallow as a puddle. Mm-hmm. you know uh for that part but that is the kind of thing like little yeah. little things that show the practical concerns of a world mm-hmm. i think are really good at that agreed yeah uh maniav uh says and and there's a pronunciation guide i hope i still did it right yep. the uh, i think so <laughs> uh says with the inclusion of metal gear solid 5 this month i want to ask how do you feel about westernized japanese developed games as an existing niche i e. games made in japan by largely japanese teams who are trying to incorporate typically western elements through gameplay story setting language or casting this can be directors uh a, at a director's discretion like kojima or miyazaki or a marketable choice such as for resident evil or silent hill 
That said, if there are many Easternized games of note, I have yet to notice. It would be interesting if there uh, if there aren't many to ponder why it doesn't work in reverse. Biggest one that comes to mind is Ghost of Tsushima, which was received very well, especially in Japan. Um, I, I feel like that's the the big example that comes to mind. But I feel like there are, you know, I guess I guess I it's you know, this is just anecdotal. It's my gut says that there are a bunch of games that are like, this is the, the samurai's journey yeah. that are done, you know, uh, from Western devs. But I, I, those games that I'm thinking of, I don't know who the dev is. <laughs> that's Cause the they, thing, they, weren't, right? they weren't games that I like. So I'd have to like do some research to see if that's true. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you wouldn't want to say the, the, the wrong thing and accidentally take away. Yeah. Um, like the, 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 the one that I can think of as Mark of the Ninja made by a Western team. Oh, but- sure. Yeah, uh, but I I just I don't know that I think that game succeeds because of its theming. I think that it succeeds because it's an amazing stealth game, and also the aesthetic is real strong. Yeah, uh, even outside of the fact that they are depicting ninjas, like they could do anything in that style, and it would work for me. You know, yeah, that could be a cyberpunk game or yeah. a gunpoint or something, and be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, it really, so we've talked about this a lot, uh, when we talked about Dark Souls, because Dark Souls explicitly, like the magic to me of FromSoft has always been, uh, you know, that reading fighting fantasy books, you know, mm-hmm. reading sorcery books, you know, this idea of what would a medieval European fantasy thing look like, but it, it is unfamiliar and canted a little bit because it is through this, this cultural barrier, mm-hmm. You know, so you end up with ideas that you wouldn't necessarily get in a Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones inspired, you know, fantasy kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, in general, I am really in favor of it. I think the reason why it does not work for me with a Kojima is that it's one, it's it's emulating a thing I don't care about, which is Western military mm-hmm. stuff. Like, I don't think Western military stuff is cool right? Uh, at all. And then also just the execution of it. Like yeah. how it's done is done through words as opposed to done through creepy images or creepy designs or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just text. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I feel like this is ground we've covered. I mean, uh, obviously it, it's, it's funny because a thing that I got recently, just looking for stuff to put up on my walls, the official Konami shop sells a framed version of the first map from silent hill. You know, mm-hmm. the map with the uh, like the, the the church and the uh, elementary school on it, you know, mm-hmm. so I sit there and look at it and it just that I, I love that as an artifact, having that up on my wall. But also it's hilarious just to look at the street names, but then also kind of just consider that this is this is what somebody from a from a decidedly, you know, who, who is decidedly not from a small American town thinks an American town is laid out like is very yeah. fun, you know, uh, and that leads into the uncanniness. Uh, Death, Earthbound, yeah, Earthbound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Deadly Premonition, as like, yes, this is a Twin Peaks pastiche, and it is set in the Pacific Northwest, but it has that. You know, I think I think that that town has the feel, you know, of a small Japanese town to me, or at least what I've been led to believe a small Japanese town was like from Shenmue. You know, mm. <laughs> so one thing I really like, you you mentioned. Uh, uh, Maniav mentions Resident Evil uh, in the response, and something I really like is that Resident Evil has transitioned away from that. Yeah, in a weird way, like it started. I mean, it's still a Japanese company that is doing things that are more Western, but it it feels less like Halloween cosplay at a certain point. Like the the early games felt like uh, emulating film, like Western mm-hmm. film, you know, specifically zombie movies and stuff. And then with Resident Evil Seven, when they got you know, writers who, you know, this is a game that takes place in America. We have native, native English speakers and writers and it started feeling modern mm-hmm. uh, and less goofy. Like Resident Evil seven saying Resident Evil seven is less goofy is, <laughs> is a silly thing to say, but I I think, I think, you know what I mean? Yes. It's less about, you know, the alphabet viruses and, you know, just that, that, this, that kind of silly, you know, we're this unit and mm-hmm. this unit took place over this unit and this, this, you know, that, that kind of units making way for units and organizations <laughs> changing names and colors and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, that's some real Kojima shit. Like that is an idea of what American paramilitary stuff is. Uh, but the silliness in seven is also influenced by movies, but feels less like the lens has disappeared. 
Yeah, you there's know? a. I mean, there's also a specificity of genre in seven. You know, like it's uh, you, you know, going going straight for gothic horror as opposed to starting at Night of the Living Dead and then wandering within the same within the same work to something that is like weird and science fiction. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see a series make a transition. Mm-hmm. You know, to to just like literally just make that there's still that lens that it, it's still east to west, but the lens has become much more clear yeah. with the later entries. Yeah. So. Uh, let's move down to life questions, I think, Gary. Let's We've do. gone for a half hour on game stuff. Um, Douglas writes, uh, I recently realized that I'm into challenge runs, but not for video games, uh, but for real life. Uh, I've always been into carpentry and have made quite a few cool tables and such, uh, but I've never used power tools other than a drill. Uh, it used to be a cost thing, but even when my dad gave me all of his tools, I still didn't use them. Uh, this is mainly because I'm untrained and scared of jagged spinning blades. Uh, but also, uh, I like the feeling of accomplishment along with the imperfections that you live with and the workarounds uh, you create to do, to do something by hand. Do either of you uh, limit what you avail yourself to uh, when trying to accomplish a task? Do you do any real life challenge runs? If so, why? Uh, is there anything you'd like to do in the future that fits this mold? Um, uh, Go ahead. I know. I was, I was just going to answer the, the question. Yeah. Uh, before that, because the Douglas also mentions, you know, I don't have a, a car, you know, me, Gary doesn't have a car, not Douglas and mm-hmm. how that is kind of a challenge run. Uh, not, not so much in the city. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm fine uh, with that. Yeah. Um, and then so the question, it, it's hard because I, I like to learn to do new things, mm-hmm. but I don't put constraints on it. Right. You know, you know, so it's like, oh, I'm, I, I would like to learn an instrument or I'm going to tr- take, try my hand at this. Uh, I do like that kind of thing. I want to get more, you know, back into it more because I feel like it's, it's part of myself that's withered a little bit and I don't, I don't like that. Um, but I don't put any kind of constraint on it. Mm-hmm. You know, it. I, I tend to be really patient with myself about stuff like that because I try to be really patient with myself in general because that makes me happier. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's answering the question exactly. Uh, I, I'm also scared of jagged spinning blades though. Ah, so if, even though it. I didn't answer the question, Douglas, <laughs> I, I'm with you. I also don't want to slice off any fingers or whatever. Oh, you get over it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I might be okay not doing that. Yeah, I, you know. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, no I mean, metal blades. The, the actual answer is you. The, the, you stay safe by staying terrified. So. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. But <laughs> you can also just buy a piece of wood. You also, you could, know, like for for me, like I don't, you know, yeah. don't take the pleasure in making a piece of wood. Yeah, well, but I mean, you know, if you're if, if even if you're trying to buy like a cut to fit a uh, piece of wood from the store, you still got to saw it yourself. There's like a miter box and everything they have there for you at Home Depot. It's it's undignified, is what it is. Home Depot um, would do it for you. Uh, I'd, I I I asked the person and they wouldn't do it. Oh, <laughs> they said, there's the miter <laughs> box over there, bud. You got a handsaw, oh. do it. The the yeah. guy the last time I went there, the the guy was just like, okay, what do you need? Oh, okay. So Weird. maybe yeah it, yeah, it could vary on the Home Deponian. Hmm. So my, 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 uh, my answer to this is going to sound like pretentious, but I'll just say it. Uh, I do this, uh, in conversation specifically if you're hanging out with people, uh, very specifically, like if somebody asks, Oh, what's that? Uh, like I don't look it up. And also I tell other people not to, not to look it up unless it's like life or death. Like what are the symptoms of choking or whatever? Just basically how long when you're hanging out with somebody, how, how long can you go without phones coming out? I think it's good. You know, you rephrase the beginning of that. Like when you say, when somebody says, what's that? Oh, what year did this come out? Well, what year did this come out or what movie was that? Or who was in that thing? Trivia. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the Stuff Will like... Hughes method of of <laughs> of like of interfacing. What, what do you mean the Will Hughes method? Oh, he he just he loves knowing trivia. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like he derives a lot of personal pleasure out of knowing trivia. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to me, uh, the, the, this is uh, me like subtweeting my parents and my family in general. Uh, mm-hmm. I the, the the phones come out immediately, and I hate it. Uh, so 
it's uh it's something i just kind of like oh if i don't know that right away it's probably not that important there we go we're just gonna go with it hmm. kind of I, I i i like being able to look up stuff personally no yeah, yeah. like i would i'd rather i mean if it's something i want to know like true, there, there's true. tons of things that come up and i just don't care yeah you know i'm not, I'm not doing that with every i don't want to like have a a HUD display that just displays little factoids about everything I'm talking about or looking at, <laughs> you know, but if I, I want to know, I don't, uh, for me personally, that, you know, no judgment, yeah. I don't, uh, derive any pleasure from denying myself that. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, ah. yeah, yeah. I just, I'm curious. Yeah. In my experience, what is tartar sauce? <laughs> it, you know, it has no tartar in it. It's named for, because of, a uh, the root word that has to do with yeah. that. I, I assume, I'm sure it had tartar in it. Cream of tartar. Mm-hmm. No. No, that's a baking so, thing. Yeah. Now, yeah. in in my ex, in my experience, once the phones come out, they stay out. Yeah. Mm. That's um, a different. That's also just like rude socializing. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like you, you know, keeping your phone in your pocket when you're being social, but being like, I'm gonna look that up, and then putting your phone away. If you're if you're capable, I have no yes. no issues with that personally. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that too. Yeah. Yeah. So so kinda kinda. Uh, Gregory uh, asks, I recently moved from Providence, Rhode Island to Knoxville, Tennessee for several reasons. And the rules in my new apartment do allow a small dog or cat with permission and a fee paid. Uh, I've always been a dog person, but I was thinking a cat might be better for an apartment. However, I've never once met a friendly cat. Anytime I've encountered one, uh, they have always gone, fuck you to me. Do you have any advice on locating and selecting a cat who would be newbie friendly? And how do you personally deal with the smell of a litter box? Uh, Boy, I have a lot to say. This could be a topic. This really like, could. So, so we'll just do cats as like a topic at some point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is no, so you have to adjust your expectations for a cat. Uh, mm-hmm. In my experience, people who are like cats are mean are just expecting them to be dogs. Yeah. You know, like a cat, the difference with a cat, like my cats are exceedingly friendly. You just have to let them control it. You know, like uh, the cat will come up to me. When it Mm -hmm. wants attention. And if I, I have learned to read the cat. So if the cat is lounging and my attention will be welcome, I can see it in the body language and stuff. It's not on tap. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dogs are on tap. And I I get the appeal of that. I didn't used to, but now I understand like why somebody might want that, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, different kind of energy, but cats are not on tap. That's the, the biggest you know, expectation change that you have to make. Like, I think any cat can grow up and be a, a nice, sweet cat. Mm-hmm. You just, you know, you socialize it, you respect its boundaries, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's basically it. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and, the, and those cats who were uh, standoffish to you before, they might have just not known you well enough. That, yep. Yeah. If you are around all the time and they're used to your smell and they know how to read you too. Uh, and you are the person who who provides them the food, uh, then that warms them up very quick. And suddenly there's kind of a mutual comfort thing going on because mm-hmm. because you're part of the same part of the same family. Right. The uh, it it is. Uh, you can also end up with cats that are just skittish or are just kind of like decorations. You know, mm-hmm. I've known people who are nice and the cats just are scared or they're just not super social. Yeah. Uh, you have to be okay with that. You know, mm-hmm. that, that is a risk. I think you can do things to minimize that, but like all, all animals do have personalities. I think it's, you know, uh, and you might end up with a cat that is, is shy or mm-hmm. what have you. Um, you know, maybe the cat will never be good with the company, but eventually like if you, it warms up to you and you warm up to it, like you could lay, you know, sit on your bed reading and they could come and just sit nearby. And yeah. that's affection, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for me, it is about adjusting expectations Yes, uh, for a pet. Like there's kind of different levels of pet. There's like dogs that instantly glom onto you. And then there's the pets that we have total dominion over like <laughs> birds and, and lizards yeah. and, and fish and stuff where you just do what you want to them. And they're too small to do anything. <laughs> You know, you don't have to respect a turtle's needs. <laughs> like, <laughs> we prefer that you did. Well, yeah, but like you, when, when you want to hang out with a turtle, you have to pick it up bodily and put it somewhere. You know, it's yeah, not yeah. a thing. Cats are in this weird in-between space uh, that I think is really easy to mistake for being standoffish, but it's really just like autonomy. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think you have to go into it respecting that. Like, yeah. and not respecting it just in a, you know, this will make a better relationship with an animal, but also like, if you admire it, you'll have a better time. Mm-hmm. Like my favorite thing an animal can be is ungovernable. I yeah. think that, uh, and like dogs kind of participate in some like absolutely pathetic surf shit. 
sometimes <laughs> like a dog running up to me and just being like, what can I do to make you happy master? I think it's a little bit pathetic. Like, again, I, I can, I can find room for that energy in my heart now, but also like grow some fucking self-respect <laughs> you pack animal, Yeah, you know, uh, they're the, I, you have to admire dignity, I think. Yeah. Uh, in a way. And then litter box, I'm a buzz market. I buzz market this all the time. Pretty litter is my favorite cat litter I've ever used. Multiple people have come over to my house and been like, I see cat turds, but I don't mm-hmm. smell cat turds. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just does really great work. Yep. And they deliver it right to your house. It's got this weird health diagnostic thing where the urine changes colors depending on like what <laughs> what you know the fire alert level is, whatever the terror alert is in your cat's <laughs> bladder. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't pay that much attention to that because I'm colorblind. Uh, but in just in terms of a litter, it's really, really good. One downside is this light, so it tracks. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of odor, it's absolutely aces. Mm-hmm. I, I just solved this problem with money. Uh, I got a litter robot and it, 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 why, the, why did they program me to smell <laughs> kill me kill me it just the, all the all the turds drop into a little tray and then i take it out twice a week and it's fine about passing cars on the overpass well yeah i mean you're not gonna waste cat turds come on no, it's good there's gold in there that's good shit <laughs> i've used i've Literally. used pretty pretty litter in the past and it uh it works really well the uh, i've also considered getting the litter bot uh space concerns Yes, in my current yeah. my current place because they're big. Yeah, footprint on them's pretty pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Uh, moving on to media questions. Uh, though this is uh, this is you. This is me. Uh, Michael says they've got two questions. Uh, what are your guys' feeling about a rumor of a Blue Point remake of Metal Gear Solid One? Uh, to me, it sounds too good to be true. Uh, and then the second question is: uh, Were you planning to return to Monkey Island too? The uh, this is a lightning round question, not it a media is. round question, but Oops. it's media related, so we'll do it now. Yeah, uh, we uh, can we we can do that. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I I don't need a remake of Metal Gear Solid One. I yeah, I think Metal Gear Solid One. The only thing I would do is I would get rid of that key card bullshit. Yeah, that you do two thirds the way through it. I I mean, I'm fine leaving Metal Gear Solid One in the past. I would need to play it mm-hmm. again. Uh, it's fine to me like yeah. it, this is a pretty good game mm-hmm. uh it gets into some nonsense that i don't like but i i, I don't really need a, a remake of it yeah personally um and i'm planning to return to monkey island mm-hmm. uh i'm really excited about it i've just got a lot of games on my plate right now that are yeah. stacked up that i want to play so it's this is where i'm going to be patient uh with it even though i am really really psyched and i want to support uh and like i'm definitely going to buy it i want to support the efforts yeah absolutely so, yeah uh excited about it you know the Boyd Park one, you know, was a total hit for me. And mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, basically want Ron Gilbert to never have to make something he doesn't want to make again. Me either. I, I am so like this last minute Ron Gilbert lapping Tim Schafer in the Adventure Game Wars has made me so happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like yep. and the, the world coming around to like Tim Schafer's real funny, but like maybe not the best game designer Uh huh. has made me very happy. Uh, we will probably just do monkey island on wolf at some point i, I yeah. imagine yeah yeah just a minute. uh noah asks uh, i've long admired the simpsons from a distance uh through the movie video games and a few recent episodes and clips i have not however been able to dive into the meat of the older stuff where do you guys recommend i begin a watch through is season one a good spot or are the later seasons better episodes to avoid thank you for your insights and wonderful podcast um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by later seasons. When we talk about late era Simpsons, we're talking about things that aired in 2001. Yes. I conventional wisdom on this tends to be true. I think, uh, the first season, I think that is a uh, real wall to wall bangers is three. Yeah. Uh, and there's still some episodes that are not laugh a minute. Like it still mm-hmm. has a little bit of a slower pace no. and then four, you're absolutely off to the races, mm-hmm. uh, basically through nine. Yeah. Through eight or nine. Uh, that's great. And mm-hmm. and if, if it doesn't work for you, it might not, it just might not, you know, work for you. If you like yeah. the movie, that's what we consider to be late era Simpsons, even though it's mm-hmm. not. Um, <laughs> if that was funny to you, I think that you will find a lot of stuff in like three through seven or eight that you'll think is very funny. Yeah. No. See, season three, the worst episode in season three, the, like is really hard to see now because they took mm-hmm. it off at Disney. Stark raving dad is a terrible season opener. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, in its place, you get uh, Mr. Lisa goes to Washington, which is very good. You get yeah. the deficit rag and the spending gap rag. <laughs> <laughs> spending gap. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so give it a shot. If you, you, if you've already like done the movie, I think you're, you're very yeah. primed yeah. Uh, in terms of episodes to skip. It doesn't really work that way. Mm-hmm. With the Simpsons, it's one of those things where there are 26 episodes per season and there's no serialized plot. Right. Like there are kind of bummer episodes. Like there are episodes of the Simpsons I really don't like, but I'm still glad I watched them because there's an A and a B plot in them. And mm-hmm. usually it's like the B plot's pretty good. Yeah. You know, uh, so it's still worth watching once, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. So. You you end up with, uh, uh, oh gosh, anything with Bleeding Gum Smurfy. <laughs> You know, yeah yeah kind like, of, kind yeah. Of, uh, you know the the homer boxing episode lisa the skeptic like there's some rotten episodes of the simpsons you don't like the you don't like the boxing episode the one where homer becomes the boxer yeah oh no i hate that episode oh wow we used to <laughs> no, call that the stinga <laughs> yeah, yeah no there's there's okay jokes in it but like there's a weird rhythm to that episode and not enough jokes in it <laughs> uh i like the stinga i like kid presentable uh, there, there, are, there are jokes I like in it. Yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah, I'll make I, I'll make orphans of his children. Oh, he has a I, mom. Well, I assume she would die of grief. <laughs> there, there are very good jokes in it. Right, like that's yeah. what I'm trying to say is even the bad episodes, there's there's stuff to like. You yeah, know, but that's, I, yeah, I've never heard somebody come out hard against uh against uh, Homer the Mo or whatever it is. Uh, no, Homer the Homer the Mo is very different. Uh, is, yeah, I can't no, remember what this one's called. No, but. yeah, it's, I'm sorry. Uh, the Homer the Mo, I think, was uh, that was the season 13 episode with REM. Yes, <laughs> yeah, mm, gluten. <laughs> uh, Senderoff says this is mostly for Cole, but I would love to hear if Gary has any interest in any of this. Uh, I just finished the Talisman for Radio Free Midworld and immediately found out uh, uh, afterwards the news that the Duffer Brothers, uh, the creators of Stranger Things, are going to make a serial adaptation of it. How do you feel about that? Are you excited or do you have some misgivings? Uh, there's a follow up question. How do you feel about Stranger Things in general? Um, I think that's a weird fit for them uh, based on what I know about you know, stranger things. I've seen two seasons of it. Like the talisman is not, uh, it's not horror. Like, yeah, it's Stephen King and Peter Straub, but it, it's, it, it's, it's about a boy who can hop between dimensions. And one of those dimensions is ours. And the other dimension is like a medieval, you know, alternate dimension. And he has to travel across the country and both of them, like there's some horror and supernatural stuff in it, but I don't feel like it plays to their strengths. Um, I feel like they would be better suited for an adaptation of black house. The, uh, the sequel to it, uh, uh, just because that is a, like a murder mystery in a small town that takes some of those same premises, you know, and, uh, works them for more, uh, you know, uh, horrific effect. Let's say, uh, it, it, it it's weird. I, th- I think that that is a weird fit for them. I have no opinion. Cause I, I don't know what the, uh, the talisman is. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than what you just told me, uh, stranger things, I thought was the first season's like a B mm-hmm. and then I started watching the second season and stopped. Yeah. Second uh, season Cause it's it lost it's me. It's not very good. Like it, it's weird how people get obsessed with that. It's, mm-hmm. it's like the, any narrative is good narrative games discourse has now leaked into TV where people just like having, like, it feels like people really want to have a plot thing to obsess over. Yeah. You know, like something that has a serialized plot that they can water cooler about, uh, kind of regardless of what it is. Yeah. You know, that that's a, that's a mean way to, but that's kind of how it feels to me. Mm. Like there was a, a time where everything on Netflix was being described to me as amazing. Right. And then I would watch it and it's like, this does the TV trick of making you want to watch the next episode, but it's mm-hmm. not amazing stuff. It's all right. Yeah. You know, it's... let things be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, Stranger Things. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the hype thing. Don't oversell it. Right. Like, yeah. you know, I feel like I, 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 I squid game to me was a B, you know, yeah. like I really enjoyed it. Uh, and it took me like an episode, an episode or two to realize that it, it took me until everybody decided to come back. Uh, mm-hmm. Spoiler, I guess. So I was like, okay, yes, this is actually like, this is actually, you know, really it's, good and not just something that was oversold to me. Right. It's pretty good. Yeah. Like it's like probably like a B plus to me, but it's not yeah. amazing. Like I just don't, it, it's, it's interesting because that, uh, people who, who participate in that, who 
participate in perpetuating a hype cycle, mm-hmm. you are, uh, at least in terms of practical effect, like you have no responsibility to curate media for me, right. but in terms of practical effect, you're probably stopping me from watching things that are really amazing because <laughs> if the same people who t- are telling me that like succession is amazing are the same people who told me stranger things is, is amazing. Mm-hmm. And then when they're like, no, 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 no. Severance is the real shit. Like you get into to some boy who cried wolf stuff. Yeah, why would I trust this in, th- this instrument to provide me a good reading? It's like the opposite of the three point seven Ronkin, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. three point six, my friend. <laughs> Sorry, okay. It's it's a yeah Ronkin. Um, yes. The uh, Ronkin is uh, the name of a Toyota dealership up here. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah. So <laughs> the, uh, Sorry, the the, the uh, Chernobyl, uh, which I cannot oversell to people enough. I think that yeah. stands up to the thing. I, so I, 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 th- I think that if we can toot our own horn on this, I think that we keep our powder dry with recommendations generally. <laughs> I think so too. And I think yeah. it, it helps a lot. Like I think yeah. if you, if you do that, like there's a weird thing where um, some people will just recommend things to you just based on, they have like on amount of fun. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it didn't like blow their mind or anything like that, but they're just like, I had an okay time with this. I can recommend it. And to me, like mm-hmm. I need to have more than an okay time with something. I kind I kind of have to feel like it is good enough to warrant um, interrupting plans. Yep. Right. Like I've got a list of movies that I want to watch. You know that I you know work work my way down, mm-hmm. and you know uh, generally if you know if somebody said to me came to me and said, "Hey, watch the endless. It is it is worth upsetting all of your plans." That would be that would be accurate. Right. Yeah. And that's that's why I recommend that movie is like, oh yeah, whatever you're gonna watch tonight, that can wait for a minute because this this I think can can bump the queue. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the, there's also, you know, we talked about this a lot with the recommendations. There's uh the flattering part of it, the ideal part of it, which is you know somebody, so you you know, hey, this is your shit. Yes. You know, that that's a really good feeling. Mm-hmm. And and people have told me that uh severance is my shit and like i believe it mm-hmm. like I, I will watch that at some point um you know and, and i'm curious about it but it's just again it is the same people who have done this about everything <laughs> it's the there's the contrarian contrarian in me you know everybody it's it's like uh everybody who recommends playing near automata to you it's like oh yeah. pushes it back a year you guys wait a year yeah it's it's a it, it, i don't necessarily think that's virtuous or anything it's just kind yeah, of yeah. an aspect of our human nature mm-hmm. you know uh KL says, uh, this is a comment, uh, regarding Welcome to Raccoon City, uh, we covered uh, Welcome to Raccoon City for an episode of Adaptation Decay, I actually know somebody who watched that film with zero catalog on the Resident Evil series. The story is really not uh, not really funny so much as predictable. They felt it was a middling horror movie that didn't make much sense and had to rely on asking the partner, who's that? And should we know why that happened? <laughs> Basically, every time a proper noun drops. On the plus side, uh, explaining about the Ashford twins or basically all of the background of Resident Evil 4 has gotten them interested in games. <laughs> Making mist- mistakes into miracles. Yeah. Uh, that's very funny. <laughs> so it served uh, its purpose. It got, it yeah. got them, interested, in, it got them uh, interested. If you're interested in more about the Ashford twins, mm-hmm. consult your local <laughs> library. <laughs> kids can't get enough of those ashford twins oh man i just say that they can't get enough of them plucking that dragonfly yeah oh yeah uh faith says after listening to abject suffering for the first time recently i discovered that it is secretly a rock opera much like pink floyd's the wall uh that goes back and forth between two songs for its entire runtime with really long skits in between uh now that you've been found out Mm. uh what do you have to say for yourself okay now for a serious question. Uh, do you ever feel like you have opinions on things just for the sake of having an opinion? Uh, coming up with something to say about things you might otherwise feel indifferent about or just lightheartedly enjoy. It seems like you actually do a pretty good job of not doing that. Your opinions seem generally uh, pretty well observed and thoughtful. Uh, thank you, Faith. Well, thank I you so much. Yeah. Um, I try not to do this, and I always notice when other people do it. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a pet peeve of mine. I'm certain that I do it sometimes, but I mm-hmm. try not to. Yeah. The the biggest thing that is me having an opinion on something I ordinarily would not have an opinion on are games for work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's because it's it's my job to have an opinion on them. Yeah. So like there are things that if we weren't playing them for the show, I would have played for 45 minutes and then stopped and just never thought of. Mm-hmm. you know, and just been like, Oh, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. Uh, but because I had to push through and that ends up having a compounding effect. Like I'm spending more time with the stuff I don't like. 
mm-hmm. and then articulating it and kind of ruminating on why I don't like it and stuff. Yeah. Uh, for for job, mm-hmm. I try not to do it for other things. Yeah, if I can. Yeah, I I just try. Uh, you know, it's none of my business. I don't have a strong opinion. I don't have to have an opinion about that. I think mm-hmm. all very powerful. Yeah, do you know? Do my best. Lots of things yeah. I, I cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, Rob has a question here. We're we're about done with show questions, but I think this is uh, interesting. So I mm-hmm. want to do this one before we move on to lightning round. Uh, I started off last summer and I've been catching up with the glorious backlog of shows. Even the oldest episodes are blasts and still hold up. Thank you. Uh, the one thing that stands out to me besides audio quality and your gorgeous deepening voices <laughs> is that you guys seem, for lack of a better word, far more aware of the audience reaction now than before. Early apps are a different story. There aren't any pauses to clarify something that's your opinion. Far fewer apologies in advance for leaving things out. Less bracing for inevitable Twitter impact. Uh, there's still the listener feedback episodes, of course, but the tone is different. To reframe this as a question, was this a conscious change? Just the natural extension of the show getting popularity and a bigger spotlight? 2010 internet being a very different place from 2022 internet. Uh, all. I yeah. think... All those are a factor. Um, it's really hard to like, this is going to, I am not a victim in this thing at all, but mm-hmm. it's really hard to understate or overstate uh, the impact that like the gamer gate crapification yeah. had on being a public person. And mm-hmm. like, I didn't get a fraction of what marginalized people got, not even beginning. Right. Right. Yeah. But the first time, like a stranger tells you to kill yourself. Mm hmm regardless of the amount of it that is a thing yeah it's uh i try you i want to be the person who just brushes that off and doesn't care Mm -hmm. uh i can't i i can control the degree of which and i can move on a spectrum of uh how much i worry about it but it it, i i would be lying if i said it didn't have an it didn't have an impact Yes. You know, like it does. It's, it sucks. It sucks to have a, a stranger just be like, Hey, you're a fat piece of shit. Kill yourself. And I'm like, well, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't expect that. I, I, you know, I, yeah, yeah I didn't mean, I, to, didn't think I was going to step on that nail, yeah. you know, G- I'm uh, going to say, didn't think that that was going to factor into this fun thing that I do with my friends. Yeah. Seems, seems non-germane to the topic of dragon quest or whatever, but <laughs> what do I know? Uh, so you, you, you unconsciously build up some stuff around that. Right. Mm-hmm. The other aspect of it, the conscious part of it, is people who are not assholes, but who are genuinely hurt by yeah. by stuff like that. Like somebody, you know, I will say something like, you know, I uh, I can't imagine somebody liking, you know, Fallout Three more than New Vegas. I think that's pretty innocuous because it's about video games. Mm-hmm. And then in somebody's head, a, a authentic alchemy happens where they're they hear me saying i think people who do think this are less and stupid yeah and that's not that's not my intent but their feelings are real and i don't want to hurt people's feelings Mm -hmm. you know i i care about that so that's the the intentional part like there's an uh, empathetic urge to some of it it's not just like not getting yelled at it's also not stepping on the flowers yeah it's um (laughs) It's one of those things how like every um every warning label has a story behind it. You yeah. know. Like if you know it it is not you know, okay. It's possibly over caution to a certain extent, but like when something is caveated or there's a disclaimer in front of something, it's because we've gotten a negative reaction to something like that before. Mm-hmm. Uh and it just to us makes sense to say like, yeah, to, to, to anticipate, right. Yeah. I will cop to a certain degree of kind of a pathological fear of being misunderstood, but part of my job as somebody who communicates for a living is, is to make myself understood and something that I've come to appreciate over the course of doing that is part of being understood is setting frame, mm-hmm. you know, it is, you know, either putting up boundaries around the conversation or highlighting or setting an expectation for a point that you're about to make. There's, you know, meta conversation that happens around whatever criticism you're going to do in regards to media or to a certain extent, like if you're going to say something about life or make a joke, you know, things like that. There's, you know, 
ground softening that you know maybe doesn't necessarily like absolutely have to happen but makes things a lot easier and better for everybody if it does yeah and and it annoys some people right mm-hmm. i don't i don't think rob is asking this from a place of annoyance but no. some people do get annoyed by it and the thing that i always say is that it's a real damned if you do damned if you don't yes on our end because if we just stop that you know i think in a perfect just world like people wouldn't take opinions about video games seriously mm-hmm. or personally rather not seriously personally yeah i think that's the way it should be uh but you know i have to live in the world that it is and if we just stop doing that entirely uh other people would be annoyed mm-hmm. or hurt or angry uh in that so we're we're going to make some people annoyed by doing it or not doing it mm-hmm. you know and we're choosing the path and have naturally kind of moved into the path that hurts the fewer, the fewest feelings gets the fewer, fewest number of people, you know, telling me I don't understand art because I don't like the intro to metal gear solid five, which Mm -hmm. happened, Uh, but fewer, you know, I just don't get art. Like, yeah, it's cinematic. I don't get art. Yeah. Art in a general, that's none of my business. <laughs> uh, the hospital scene in that, that's art. What I like is not art. And that I just don't understand the difference. I'm, you know, absolute, you know, Blundstone. Uh, I get the, 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 the least of that. And, and uh-huh. it plays into like bigger things too. It plays into like choices and stuff. Like I promise I have things that I could say about the play and plot of like a kingdom hearts. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like there's critical meat on those bones. There are. Uh, it's not worth it breaking that containment. Yeah. And just uh, a lot of people who have a lot of their identity wrapped up in those games uh, being hurt. A lot of people who would think less of per like say personal mean things to me about, because I said things about a video game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not worth any of that. Right. You know, so it, it's, it's all those things. It's conscience. It's, uh, because of a bigger spotlight. It's because of the changing internet, you know, thing. And it's also some of it is just instinct. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like we've answered a version of that before, but I, I just, I find it really interesting because we just did Metal Gear Solid five, which was caveated, but intense and, uh-huh. uh, you know, kind of really brought a wide swath of, of responses uh, into my personal sphere or whatever. Yeah. Somebody told you, you don't understand art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the answer in that question feels salient. Uh, and you know, uh, not everybody has heard previous times where we've done it, you know? Yeah. I got, I got a douchebag who keeps making new accounts to yell at me. Oh God. Uh, that guy. And, and it keeps happening. He took some time off, but he he came back and stuff and it's really hard. Again, I don't have it a fraction as bad as anybody who's, from a marginalized identity. I am not world's smallest violining. I'm talking to gen pop, like people who do not have uh, an online presence. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to express like the effect it has to just have somebody who's like, you're their personal hate sink. Yeah. And, and you know, Kojima is my personal hate sink, but I don't (laughs) add him. Uh huh. (laughs) Like, I'm not saying that to DMS being like, you know, you should quit. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not creating a new Twitter account every day to to try to harass him it's a it, it's a lot of effort that this that this person is going into um, yeah yeah and it, it has it has an effect i don't want it to mm-hmm. have an effect but it has an effect yeah, it's cumulative too you know yeah. it just it's it, it's it stays in the system even if the individual effect of one is small yeah 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 there's, there's trace amounts of rat feces in my twitter feed because of this <laughs> douchebag right. because of this sad sad little peasant man yeah um yeah should we uh lightning round we should lightning round it up. Uh, let's see here. This will be me. Uh, Nick says, I know Gary has mentioned Magic the Gathering a few times, uh, but I'm wondering if, I, if, either, if he either has a favorite card or a favorite color combination uh, for either aesthetic or mechanical reasons. My favorite colors are Celestia, as I love to make tokens and go wide. Thanks. Love the show. Uh, I know. What did I act, did I activate somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a horrible slur that I said? <laughs> oh man, you you don't use the hard S word. <laughs> don't don't say hard Selesnya on the show, man. <laughs> uh, no, there are uh, little clans that are the different color 
uh, combinations that okay. came after my biggest magic. I know those because I watch a bunch of magic YouTubes and okay. stuff, but it came after my big magic time. Okay. Uh, I think that the color combination name for the color combination I like is Demir, which is blue and black. Okay. Uh, and then my all-time favorite card, and this is, it's not a powerful or good card now, but I just love the art on it, and it was big for me as a kid, is mm. the Hypnotic Spectre. Mm. Um, love that guy. Back so. when I attempted to play uh, Magic the Gathering with my brother's decks mm-hmm. that he had way back when, I, I checked the values on them. None of them are worth anything. Uh, huh. But uh, <laughs> my, 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 my color combination was blue, was blue and black, actually. That's blue funny. Blue and black's awesome. Devious yeah. and evil. <laughs> it's real fun mechanically like it's not all my favorite stuff or anything yeah. it's just the coolest flavor uh, oh, to yeah. me because i'm a dilettante <laughs> uh naveen uh, asks offset control sticks like the nintendo or xbox or symmetrical control sticks like the playstation what do you prefer and why symmetrical okay That's yeah right. i i just i just like the symmetrical one i don't know necessarily know that i have a reason for it like i really like the setup on the steam deck you know um, mm-hmm. I, I'm one of the only people in the entire world who liked the, uh, the Wii U pro controller, Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that. Yeah, no, I like, uh, an, I, I like symmetrical. I, uh, my hands will adjust to either one. Yes. Like pretty quick. I think that if I literally had just had my druthers, it would be asymmetrical. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't feel strong opinions about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that that's kind of the same for me too. It's like I it, neither of them is unusable for me. Yeah, yeah. My it's weird how quickly I'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sleepy Smile says, "Hi, Duckweed boys. Uh, here's just a, here's a just fun and question for you. Uh, what are some of your favorite animals? When do you sounds? think you'll die? <laughs> I think Sleepy Smiles is misunderstood. Just fun and yeah, ju- 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 just this fun, is just fun. This is, is serious. When this getting... is just fun. <laughs> uh yeah well what what are some of your favorite animal sounds um uh, just like the top uh whatever you can think of they give some examples um mm-hmm. some you know some of which i uh, i i vibe with uh like mm-hmm. the the cooing of doves cat sure. meows and purrs that weird chirping noise they do at birds yeah all, all cat noises are good to me yes uh i was just recently on the coast uh sea lions nature's dorks uh, they're like door, 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 like noise they make, I think is really charming. Yeah. Like, it sounds like somebody making fun of them or they're all just <laughs> roasting one specific sea lion, like sea lion, you know, <laughs> like, Hey, this is Chumbus is, this is what Chumbus sounds like. And they just like all, duh, 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 duh. Uh, yeah. I like that a lot. I like it when uh, elephants walk and it goes ding 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 ding. Wait, wait, no, I thought elephants were do 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 do. Oh, you're right. That is the elephant walk. I was doing like a, a you know, just like a, a big fat big guy tuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a nostalgic one for me. I really like the sound of like uh, of of frogs, like in the morning. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, that's just because uh my grandparents had like a uh a campsite with like a, where they would take where we would stay in their rv and they had like a deck mm. built and just like it was right next to a like a like, like a couple of ponds and just you would wake up in the morning and hear the birds and the and the and just the constant f- frog frog ribbiting going on mm-hmm. yeah takes me takes me right back when i hear that kind of chorus effect there yeah country roads yeah yeah uh, animals make good sounds they do. Uh, Maya uh, asks the sexy gin from George Miller's action packed follow up to Fury Road, 3000 Years of Longing, appears before you and offers a simple wish. If you, Gary Orkel, could directly take part in the creative process from idea to final product without having to actually do real work, but having complete creative and financial freedom, what project would you tackle? I would make a choose your own adventure. A uh, real life mini golf course that is a party based RPG with boss mm. holes and stats uh, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Indoor, ideally, um, and multiple floors and levels with different biomes and stuff. Yeah, uh, I'll 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 take this one and say video game adaptation of the Dark Tower. There you go. You know, I mean, if if, if money and time are not a problem, and it could be like a like a massive you know trilogy of things, then yeah. Gonna do that. Oh. Uh, Austin says, 
Uh, this is a question for Gary. Is Modric playing any shows right now? As a longtime fan of the network and as a fellow Portlander, uh, I'd love to come out to support you and your musical endeavors as well. Uh, it would be nice to meet you and say thanks for all the years of enjoyment you and Cole and the gang have brought to my life. Uh, currently, we don't have any shows. This was a cursed summer for Modric. We all passed COVID around. Mm. And then, uh, you know, not at the same time, like we all got it kind of in succession. Uh, Andrew had some medical stuff, travel and everything. So we have not done a whole lot this summer when we intended uh, to. Um, a cool way you can support us is pick up the PDX Pop Now uh, compilation, which we're on. Mm-hmm. Um, which is like indie uh, Portland bands. And then we're looking to book some shows in October, November. And the best way to know about that would probably be to follow my Twitter uh, where, I, where I announce them and don't kill me. Uh, at the thing. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, th- there's a, you know, th- that, that barn's already out. That horse is already out of the barn. I can't do like a Duke silver mm-hmm. thing where nobody knows when I'm playing. I've already talked about the band. Right. Uh, it wouldn't take too much for someone to put two and two together. So I don't feel bad announcing it on a show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can come up and say hi. That, that's happened before mm-hmm. at shows. Uh, it's nice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm in a weird mode after that performance puts me in a weird mode. So I might go into like awkward customer service reflex <laughs> yep. mode. And there's a lot, uh, one of my least favorite feelings is being in the way of, of people. And you are never more in the way than when you have just played a set. Yeah. Uh, at a show and you have to take down for the next band. That is a intense division of people coming up and saying nice things. And then, but having to get your shit out of the way right away. Yeah. Uh, that puts me in a real weird headspace. But if afterwards, if I'm like hanging out, having a beer, watching the next band or whatever, yeah, come say hi. Mm-hmm. Do it. Yeah. Um, Tyler uh, says, you have the power to drop a fully guppy charged Will Hughes on any podcast you wish and force them to have him as a special guest. Who do you unleash your chaos champion of Gallivant upon? Uh, my choice would be What a Cartoon with Bob and Henry. They're too nice <laughs> to do yeah, that too. Well, and I want to torture Will a little bit during yeah. this too, right? Like it, it can't just be, you know, the weapon. It, like violence harms the the doer. Uh huh. You know, in the in the scenario too. I was trying to think of what like the most serious podcast was that didn't talk about like serious social issues that would would make me dispatching Will there as a joke offensive. <laughs> You know, uh, like I, you know. I, I can, I can, I can split that difference for you. I drop them on knowledge fight. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Two comedians yeah. talking about Alex Jones shit. Yeah. Yeah. And just, uh, see, see what he, what, see how he does that Yeah, stuff. That That's a safe, that's real, but safe. I was just thinking if there was any like incredibly dour, you know, <laughs> podcast about bad things, but all the, the podcast about bad things are all like smiling goofballs. Right. You know? Yeah. You know, just put, put, put him on QAA. Just, yeah, that's yeah. fine. He'd be, he'd be fine. I don't think, I don't think that's is, he doesn't know a whole he's lot not, about in, that stuff. Yeah, he's it's not, not his interest. Yeah. Yeah. It's not exactly. It's not his interest. It's not a function of ignorance or any kind of character flaw. Yeah. It's just not interesting to him. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, Francisco says a fuck, Mary kill Yokotaro Suda 51 and sweary 65. Ooh. Interesting. I, uh, this is here's where I, I admit that I get Suda 51 and Sweary 65 games confused a lot of the time. Suda 51, Killer 7 guy, Sweary is Deadly Premonition. Got you. Um, I would, boy, um, that's tricky. I, I guess I would marry, uh, Suda 51. Okay. Cause I, out of those games, those are the ones I like the best. Mm hmm. You know, and then I'd at least be, I wouldn't have to pretend like my, my spouse was, you know, I had to pretend interest in things my spouse was making. That's a bad feeling. Right. Uh, And then I I couldn't fuck Yoko Taro Mm because he'd be wearing the mask. Yeah. That's too much. So I guess I'd fuck Swery 65 and that's killing Yoko Taro, which is too much. It's more than I want for him. I just don't want to hear about him anymore. Yeah. But it's the, it's the nature of the question. It's the nature of FMK. Someone's going to die. I, I would, um, I, I, I would uh, flip Suda and Sweary, uh, yep. ma- 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 Mary Sweary, fuck Suda, uh, Yokotaro. I don't have as much disdain for him as you do, but I think that he he's is, gotta die. he's too hostile to the player to, you know, to, yeah. to, 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 to me, you know, horrible husband. Like, 
Yeah. What a nightmare. What what kind of mind games you'd constantly be under. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just, no thanks. Just, 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 just trying, um, um, imagining, like, splitting the duties of, like, washing the dishes with that man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if I I can't remember which one does the transphobia stuff. If I said I was going to marry the transphobia person, that wasn't why. I just right. am not up on that discourse. Right. So I don't think anyone's going to yell at us about the that answer to that FMK, the yeah. most problematic <laughs> FMK answers in the history of podcasting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, 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 same as well. I'm not, I guess I'm I'd not, marry I'm the not Koch a... brothers, and I would uh, <laughs> I'd fuck Bezos, and I'd uh, I yeah, kill kill, uh, kill Bernie. You know, yeah, yeah, kill Bernie. Yeah, the 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 worst uh, FMK that could be. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> what does Chris ask? Uh, Chris says this one's more for Gary. Uh, you mentioned before that you read comics. Just wondered what kind of comics you're into. Any recommendations? Comics are probably my second preferred entertainment medium after video games, and I'm always looking for new stuff to check out. Uh, I'm bad at new stuff mm-hmm. in comics. I have the digital subscriptions for Marvel and DC and I read old stuff and I read X-Men stories I missed and occasionally pop in, uh, to like renowned storylines yeah. that I, uh, that I missed on my first, first time around, but it, it's purely a nostalgia exercise for me. Um, there are, I really need to go into a new comic store and have a relationship with that comic person to get kind of plugged into new stuff. Yeah. Like the comic podcast I listen to is called house to astonish and it comes out like once every two months. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm very much old man hobbyist at comics. Gotcha. So I haven't, uh, haven't got anything new that is like, I pick up every Junjito that comes out mm-hmm. and, and read them. Uh, but that's about it for like new stuff for me. Yeah. I'm not, uh, and I don't really read Western comics. I'm just, I just kind of, you know, fell, fell fell off of those. But like reading manga, uh, you know, uh, 20th century boys, you know, working my way through that. Um, it's it's all it's all old shit. Reading Orochi, uh, like the most current stuff that I'm reading is like Dora Hetero and uh, uh, Chainsaw Man. But like, you know, not necessarily the 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 most cutting edge kind of kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's good stuff out there, but I, I sadly just don't know it. Yeah. Um, uh, Rick says, in my job, I often get spam email from recruiters offering to connect me with, quote, top talent and people offering software engineering tools that are wildly unrelated to my work. What kind of stupid spam do podcasters get? Great question. Uh, uh, about you know, what, once a week. So I, I, you probably get more of this because the official accounts. Uh-huh. We get a, an email to my Gary at duckfeed.tv thing about somebody offering to like partner with everything to Guppy, <laughs> uh, which is very funny because <laughs> uh, it's not a, like an explainable thing. And they like, they don't want that. No. <laughs> or we'll get things like there's a guy, a uh, guy who does uh, um, star photography. Okay. Who's got a book promotional thing and he must just be his publishers just doing a real wide net. Okay. So I, I, I've gotten multiple times like, Hey, I noticed your podcast, you know, John Stargazer has been working on this book for a long time and would love the opportunity to come on and talk about it. And where I'm so tempted to just have him on and just ask what he thinks about these items and guppy, <laughs> like not let him bring it up at all. You know, like you're in our house. Yeah, we're, we're talking about three dollar bill this week. Yeah, you're gonna what have to talk to your feel? publicist about this. Yeah, the uh, but th- that's the kind of stuff I get. What what stuff shows up on your end? Oh my god, it's a fucking nightmare, Gary. Yeah. Uh, so somebody, I, I I don't know if people are trawling directories and just pulling the uh, uh, the stuff down from there. So much stuff about NFTs. Uh, mm. So many offers from like Web three po- uh, podcast host kind of deals um a lot of um like offers to talk to like web three influencers uh Mm. we're on a few different pr lists uh for just like generally like do you want to have this expert for their new gardening book to come on just complete completely non non non-related and even the stuff that's about um that's about games is real weird got one here uh new weird survival game once human reveals vital updates of formulas system and gun perks (laughs) going wide with many tokens with selesnia gaming and network observability how it's changing the game 
Uh, <laughs> boy, we should just send all the experts to Guppy. Like I'm going <laughs> to check in with Will and see if we can just pivot to like anybody who wants to come on the podcast can. I mean, uh-huh. then, then we're going to get some Nazis are going to ruin it, yeah, but like uh, be really just an expert in your field. So what do, what do you think of this? And just do that over and over until word gets around and we get off of those lists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, Oh, uh, news release casting to begin on Love and Karma, per- presu- produced by Bontica Entertainment. I had no idea what that means. <laughs> Good to know, though. Just, just uh, com- completely irrelevant press releases. It's ho- hopefully, somebody just heard that and they're like, "Shit, I was waiting for that to come out." <laughs> you know, and we just made somebody's day. Yeah. Uh, Alex says, uh, politicians aside, what's the worst opinion you've ever heard? Someone once told you, told me they walked out of Birdman because there wasn't enough action and I had to take an angry nap. I, I, I tried to just do a search and see any time that I, uh, quote retweeted, uh, something alongside Austin Walker's amazing. You ever you, a tweet, <laughs> you ever hear so a take so bad, you have to immediately go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't find uh, any of those specific things, but uh, I keep that. I keep that on. Uh, I have that bookmarked so I can yeah. just whip it out when it is uh, salient. It's really useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the one that I've heard, and it, it's a, a person I respect. I just think it's a really wild opinion. Uh, is Cat Bailey saying that Chrono Trigger is the most uh, mechanically perfect role playing game? <sighs> uh, which uh, that made me want to go to sleep. Like I, I like Chrono Trigger. Like we yep. did. It. I think that's a good game. Nice uh-huh. and breezy, fun story, cute characters, good music. Uh, mechanically, though, and, and best, yeah, RPG. Like there's there's no part of that that is acceptable uh, yeah. to me. Like that is that is a wild opinion, and it, it's possible she's revised it. It's mm-hmm. possible even she was being flippant, and I miss the the tone, like a tone. Yeah, cue. That, was, that, that was on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it's it's possible, but I, I've always thought that was just like that's so wrong. Uh-huh. Like it's just like, even if you were like it's the best game, it's it's got to yeah. be the gestalt of it, you know. Can't be yeah. these, these very very simple systems. Uh, you know, I, 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 that might also be a generational thing too. You know, not that she, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, she, because she I, talks about RPGs for a living, like she, she her does. main podcast yeah. is. She's keeping up with them. Yeah, you know. Uh, but like, uh, I have another one around the time that uh, the Live Alive remake came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Kohler. Again, somebody I respect, somebody who does, you know, amazing work by the Calabunga collection, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, like all of that, uh, tweeted like, oh, it's so refreshing to go back to, to get to, to go oh, back yeah. to an RPG that's just bare bones. Yeah. The, the, they, uh, Chris had a, a editorial for Kotaku at one point when he worked there that was like in, pr- in, in praise of fight magic item. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. that we we left that behind because it's awful yeah like it, it's and, you are the reason why we can't have nice things yeah like, and, you're the uh, audience that's keeping this genre dead and or like I, shitty i've 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 played like i'm kind of just kind of gumming at the edges of the live alive uh remake that also doesn't necessarily apply to that game like there's there's mm. like a there's a complexity to that like i didn't i had no idea that that was a grid-based you know, like area yeah, effects yeah. kind of okay, kind of deal. Like it, it, it is almost pointedly not fight magic item. <laughs> well, I think that he's probably bemoaning modern Final Fantasies being character action games. Yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, Rami Ismail again, like a lot of people who I generally respect who just have yeah. some some wild opinions. When Final Fantasy 15 came out, tweeted like, you know, Final Fantasy Final Fantasy 15 is the best RPG I've ever played and nothing else. And then when people asked him why, he's like, I don't want to explain it. I don't have to explain it. Okay. And I was like, is this some kind of weird bait? Yeah. Like, why, why are you, what are you doing? If who it are sounds you? Like, what is this? Like, <laughs> like, if it sounds like we're picking on people who are good, I think it's because the Delta between like how respectable and like generally I'm with them on a lot of other things, the Delta between that and kind of the awfulness of the take in question. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it, you know, the, the worst take is, uh, you know, Colin Moriarty making jokes about women not being in video games or whatever. Like right, right. The, the worst takes are, are evil. You yeah. know, we're, I'm trying to take this in, in a fun direction where it's like wild takes, 
uh, you know, weird, you know, bad opinions, not harmful opinions. Yeah. Like I could just come out and dunk on that guy who said about the Grand Theft Auto leaks, like, oh, they work on the visuals first. What you saw there was what you're going to get, which is like, that's a, that's a bad opinion, which is just wrong. But also like that is nobody. There's no, there's, there's no sport in that. That's just, you you cheated the game. You cheated yourself. (laughs) You know, like stuff like that. That's a joke. Like that. That's a horrible opinion. Yeah. You know, but it's just not surprising, I guess. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, woke Gator. You know, <laughs> that's a horrible opinion. <laughs> like, God, I always forget about Woke Gator. Oh, how can you forget about Woke Gator? <laughs> that Gator did us all a service by killing a privileged white child. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I just I forget again. It's one of those. I feel like I need to go to sleep. I like Add my woke gator to smash. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Ness, run. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk enough about Ness's privilege. <laughs> I, <laughs> like he does get thousands of dollars in allowance. Like, he does. Yeah. Once a day or whatever. So, they, I mean, they, actually, let, let, let's actually talk about Ness's privilege. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> to medium. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pitch this to, well, all the websites died. So, Oh yeah. Um, no. And one day it was weird. Yeah. Um, <sighs> God. Uh, that was, yeah. Uh, Andrew says, uh, Hey guys, to observe Spook- Spooktober, uh, I usually play a Resident Evil game and have caught up with most of the mainline series. The two I have left for this year are Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil 6, which would be the better Halloween treat. I suspect the correct answer is neither replay one of the good ones, but have one of those completionist brains that won't allow that. Uh, play six. Six yeah. is underrated. We, we you're, you're talking to the two biggest fans of Resident Evil Six on the planet. Sorry, Jala uh, exists and she oh, is yeah. not on the show right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, Jala also big, big fan. Definitely, you know, safe space for Dark Souls Two and Resident Evil Six. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with Resident Evil Six. If you can play a co-op, yep. Uh, it's long. It's it's doing it's it's way longer than other Resident Evil games. Yeah, you know, of the time. Uh, but I I think it's fun. Yeah. Um, and I think Resident Evil Zero, while it is arguably spookier is just not fun there uh, are fundamental problems foundational problems yeah. with re0 play resident evil zero until you leave the train yeah like to play the the very first kind of intro that's real fun mm-hmm. uh, after that it gets kind of poopy yeah um the the babadook says there are plenty of horror and spooky games to play around halloween but are there any games you enjoy that you strongly associate with other holidays big or small uh be that from a personal history or just a general aesthetic Mm, for a very long time, I just played a, a whatever JRPG I was hankering for around the holidays. Mm-hmm. That coincided with uh, with college when I would have a bunch of time off, you know, and would be back at home, you know, not necessarily on the best television or what have you. Just like, oh, just bring my PlayStation 2 and we'll sit down and um, use this downtime to just uh, kind of like nuzzle under this warm blanket kind of deal. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah, I uh, not so much uh, from when I was young. Like I'm sure I did that, but I'd also associate that with summer. Yeah, you know uh, things. Now, ever since we started doing winter WRPG, I have a very strong and pleasant association of like chugging quests. Yeah, like a weird. You know, it's not the best game or anything we've done, but I have a very positive uh, association with going through Dragon Age Two. Oh yeah. And like, again, not a perfect game, like a lot of problems, but just kind of like going into a uh, list based kind of mindset in the Mm -hmm. winter, you know, wearing a sweater and just doing quests. Yeah. Uh, That's more of an adult association than a child association Mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And that's not a holiday. That's just a, uh, you know, though it's not specific Christmas, it just happens to be where Christmas falls. Yeah. Yeah. Winter time. Yeah. Winter. Um, uh, Lucky McChancy says, uh, hypothetical, someone makes a Lovecraft themed drink called Gug Chug. Uh, would you try it? It yes. depends on who made it. And if I trusted them, like if they're going to put like pureed oysters in it or whatever, pro- mm-hmm. probably, probably not. But, uh, if I know that they're not somebody who's going to do some kind of like awful stunt for stunt on me, then, uh, the, the, then yes, I will do it. I would do it regardless. Okay. Gotta try the gug chug. <laughs> At the very least for podcast purposes. There are a lot of like horrible things I'll do for podcast. <laughs> like I talk about the gug chug on abject suffering. 
Uh, and our final lightning round question, uh, Rye asks, uh, I'm still catching up on the backlog and haven't heard every dispatch, so apologies if this has been asked. I know you all did Shovel Knight for a bonfire side chat, but is it possible you'd cover the whole treasure trove? Also, what are your opinions on the spinoffs, Pocket Dungeon and Dig, if you've had the opportunity to hit the latter by the time this is asked? Thanks. Uh, I think you're both rad and love how you make me think about games. Thank you, Rye. Thank you, Rye. Um, I would love to do more Shovel Knight. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there is a suite of games that we covered on watch out for fireballs thinking like, Oh, we've basically said the final word on this because they're similar. So that we that covered I'm, on bonfire side chat. Well, well, well both like okay, I, I'm, yes. I, I'm, I'm building towards that, okay. uh, that I'm, I'm rejecting now in, in retrospect. Like I don't want to, I think I'm sure we said when we covered Tony Hawk two and Mario golf at the same time, we're like, this is the final word on Tony Hawk. No, uh, I don't. I don't want it to be the final word on Tony Hawk. Nope. There's level design to talk about. There's vibes to talk about. Soundtracks mm-hmm. to talk about. I would like to talk about. We love Katamari at some point. Yep. You know things like that. Uh, same thing with Shovel Knight. Like uh, Shovel Knight, those that treasure trove. Um, they change things a lot. And yeah. Those like those are really impressive bits of game design. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's not one of them I think is bad. No. Yeah. Um, like they're all good. I, I think I still prefer original Shovel Knight. Mm-hmm. But all of the spinoffs are fun. Yeah. Uh, or all of the uh, the alternate Treasure Trove versions. The spinoffs, uh, I haven't played Dig yet. I played Pocket Dungeon. And Pocket Dungeon has a problem, I think, where it moves too quickly to know what an enemy does. Okay. Like, I, I had a hard time getting into it because enemies would show up and they would have capabilities that I couldn't read on a timed puzzle uh, kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of got in my way and I stopped playing yeah. it. So I, I played a little bit, but I was like, oh, this isn't exactly what I'm looking for. And kind of stopped. I have not played dig yet, which looks like a, a Mr. Driller, mm-hmm. uh, version of that. And I, I am so dog shit at Mr. Driller. Yeah. I like the idea of Mr. Driller, but it, it's very hard for my, my eyes to parse. Yeah. I, I, I like the idea of being good at Mr. Driller, but any, anything that revolves around, uh, combo based color matching I end up being very bad at uh, if mm-hmm. it is not I mean literally Tetris Attack <laughs> Pokemon yep. Puzzle League no thank you sir that doesn't work for me it needs to be Tetris Attack for the SNES yep, yep. <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, so, yeah so uh, have you messed around with the treasure trove no stuff at all um, it's cool so mm-hmm. imagine at first it just seems like it's going to be you have a different movement mm-hmm set and it's the same levels but the levels are all remixed in ways that are really clever um it's it reminds me of like one of my favorite things is when a new smash comes out i don't like playing smash brothers that much anymore but i like learning how you know game design is translated to a fighting game context yeah like you know what would the the duck hunt dog play like yeah you know i think that's really interesting this reminds me of that a little bit it's a similar kind of feat as mm-hmm. somebody who who just appreciates game design in a in a aesthetic and kind of artistic sense. Yeah, I never messed around with them, kind of because I always figured we would end up going back to it at some point. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, wanted to. Uh, I, I, I'm not again it. Yeah, would love to do it. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to our topic. Let's do. Uh, I you're the one who picked out the topic, so I will defer to you. I I did. Uh, I I chose this. So this is uh, from Andrew. Uh, and they say, uh, in a recent Final Fantasy XII episode, uh, there was a very interesting discussion about Gary's recent realization that maybe he just doesn't like children's media much anymore. I'd love to hear a more expanded discussion of this, since this is incredibly relevant to the video game medium. Video games were considered a kid's media for so much of the medium's existence, and even moving past that remain an unusual case in which many of the canonized greatest works, for example, Chrono Trigger, were created for children the f- first and foremost. Were the ramifications of this on the game medium positive or negative? Uh, yeah. And the reason why I was interested in this is expanding this out to, you know, what makes children's media work or not work? What is the diff- What is the quality of children's media that does work yeah. for adults? Like, what things does that have? Uh, does this matter? Um, are there, uh, what happens when things go too far, mm-hmm. you know, with this? Because, like, a lot of times, as somebody, one of the things that, that, that this makes me think of is somebody who likes things that are made for adults. Uh, me saying that, it's... I oftentimes get misinterpreted as wanting like edgy gritty shit, which is not the case. Yeah. yeah, Not the case. Like I do sometimes like that kind of stuff, but that's also childish. Like, 
you know, doom or dusk. That's, that's kid shit in a great way, like in, <laughs> right. in, a, in a good way. That's silly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there are bloody ju- ju- scarecrows everywhere. Juvenile. Yeah. Yeah. It's juvenile in a way that's appealing to me. It's not mature because it's gory and bloody. Right. You know, and, and you know, the suffering or what have you, like there, there are ways <laughs> yeah. to go too far with that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I like the DreamWorks school of making children's media that works for everybody, you know, just, uh, it can be, you know, front to back fart jokes, but as long as there are some kind of like winking and nudging at the parents, you know, maybe just, uh, you have Shrek looking directly at the camera and making a joke about how pussies and dicks smell different. Sure. Or, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody makes a joke about paying alimony it, to my battle axe of a wife. Is no. the, the pussies and dicks smelling different from <laughs> no, something? No. Well, that, that's very good. Like, <laughs> we gotta notice our pussies and dicks smell different. Don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> unsheath your wild hog and let me get a sniff. It's uh, a good Shrek impersonation. <laughs> yeah, he's, a- <laughs> <laughs> just like him. He's an ogre. He's uncouth. <laughs> yeah, tra- transport you to the Highlands. They do, but they do be smelling different, though, Shrek. <laughs> you, got, you gotta hand it to him. They do be smelling totally different. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. How come pussy and boots smell different than dick and boots? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh man, obvious. Obviously, I'm I'm joking. That's one of the worst ways to go about it. Yeah. It, I mean, I I would clap like a circus seal <laughs> if that <laughs> happened. <laughs> but also, I don't know. Like, it's a uh, go, go back, uh, listen to our episode about uh, the episode of Adapt- Adaptation Decay about Game Over, the, t- yeah. <laughs> the terrible uh, CGI uh, sitcom about a family of video game characters. What do they do when uh, when, when, the, when the game is over? You yeah. know, what if a bunch of people absolutely sucked ass? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I so I I've thought about this a lot because you know when you said this in in the Final Fantasy twelve episode and the bug snacks uh, came up as well yeah. since that's kind of like a, a Muppet you know a bad Muppet program a lot of the times mm-hmm. when people are talking uh, the the thing that I am keying into about children's media that I don't like is uh, lowering the register or condescending the register of storytelling like what I, I think i'm picking up on is being talked down to yeah you know things being overly simplified because it feels like the creator does not trust me uh that is the death knell for me enjoying a piece of kids media mm-hmm. uh, my favorite kids media is very confident uh in in it being weird it trusts myself and children to just get it yeah. things are not repeated over and over simple concepts are treated as given or trusting kids to pick it up from context. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why I like that is because that's what I feel like a lot of the kids media that I liked as a kid uh, was like, Yeah, you know, like it wasn't like, uh, you know, the rats of Nim, which is, was an animated movie I really like and liked as a kid does not stop to explain what animal testing is. Right. Like you pick that up from context though. Mm -hmm. Like what's happening. Even if you, I had no idea they they tested things on animals you know right. and even if i didn't get it it created a, a mo like a moment you know where i could ask my parents like what's this about and they could explain something about the world to me i think that is valuable mm-hmm. so as an adult it just takes it like this is common knowledge we're going to treat it as common and then as a kid it's either you pick it up on through context or you ask and it becomes a learning moment mm-hmm. it doesn't grind everything to a halt to condescend to me and and explain to me these things and that's what kills children's media the, 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 that I think if you really hit on something there, which is uh, children's media uh, morally condescending uh, mm. to you know to, 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 to somebody like we need to you know, yes, there's the confidence like okay, we need to make sure that you never at any point feel lost during this, but also like this you know this needs to have vitamins to it, and we're gonna goddamn make sure they're absorbed. Um, yeah. And so uh, things that, you know, could be emotionally felt, I think rats, the, the rats of Nim is a really good, uh, is a really good example. You don't have to like know all of the context around that to understand that something seriously fucked up is going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it, it like it, it hits and feels true. And ultimately you're left with an idea that like animals are worthy of empathy, you know? Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, you know, something that I think 
uh, kind of a lesser or more mainstream work, you know, like a, like a, like a, like a Disney you know, rescuers or whatever, it would try and get you to em- emphasize, em- empathize with animals just by making them people. They're, 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 they're people, but they happen to just be rats. Yes. So they're, 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 they're mice here and the, they're going to, they're going to give you lessons about people, but also it's animals. 100%. Like the, the fact that, uh, that also touches on another thing, which is brushing up against real world. No, you know stuff like I. I generally Disney leaves me really cold, mm-hmm. uh, and and even as a kid, like there are Disney movies I like, right? Like a mm-hmm. big fan of Robin Hood, uh, like Sword in the Stone. There, there are Disney movies I like. Uh, one of the reasons why I can't go full on Disney pill with this resurgence and with uh, Kingdom Hearts and with the you know the video games that are taking place in the Disney world, uh, and having the nostalgia for it is that they're always just people. Yeah, you know it's always just like they're the Aristocats. AKA the aristocrats, <laughs> you know, it, or like, and, and the, the messaging in it, it ends up feeling like it's really, so like Bambi is something else that tries to make sympathy for animals, yeah. right? Like another, another work that tries to do that. It just doesn't feel like it. it's so direct. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the emotional storytelling is aimed at such a low register. Like, a, a, a it's, Oh, you feel sympathy for animals because a hunter killed an animal and here's its orphaned, a child, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to Rats of Nim, which is animal testing in a which is a really complicated, yeah, like issue, you know, and is like hunting is I guess also complicated, you know, but just throwing a dead mom in my face <laughs> is a really simple carb, yeah, you know, as opposed to like, hey, consider that these rats escaped from this mm-hmm. thing and, and as essentially, you know, have been experimented on and become elevated in this way. And what is left behind, like, in the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the community when that happens is just a more chewy question and a, a difference between the best media and the worst media to me is how much you can chew on it. Yeah. You know, I need to chew a little bit to, to, to really, really, really love something. It, it comes through in a lot of different aspects. It's a big thing. It's the reason why the archeology span approach to storytelling and in, in from soft games works for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it has nothing to do with children's media, but you have to chew. Like, I get to own it a little bit. Yeah. Like, I, I need that profundity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, like, you know, bringing this up in Final Fantasy XII, just like, oh, she's sad because her, her husband died. Yep. You know, isn't that sad? Here's his force ghost. But it's sad because a husband dying is sad. That mm-hmm. feels like rubbing Bambi's mom in my face. Yeah. You know, and that is, it's just too simple of a sugar to mm-hmm. derive any nutrition from. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's not always true in the best children's media. They don't do that. Right. And it's, um, you know, we are just, just so much of my, my critique or just understanding of things is about context, you know, mm-hmm. like the, the, you know, Oh, hu- husband, husband, death, sad, you know, it will bring you husband harm. Like yes. that, th- that exists in a game that also has the scene, you know, where we joked about, Oh, they, they had subtext, you know, yeah. just kind of like saying without saying, you know, if you do something to me, or, you know, I can have you arrested and sent right where you need to go. And yeah. it is not explained like, all right, so if you do this, you know, like at no, at no point does somebody bring out a whiteboard uh, and uh, put, put the, you know, put things up on there and, and explain with uh, uh, pigs and bunnies, you know, what's, mm-hmm. what, what's going to happen there. And then elsewhere in the same work, the pig, the pigs and bunnies and the whiteboard uh, comes out. Yes. See also Terra Enigma, which is a weird and off putting game about the create the destruction and creation of the world that, you know, has some real pigs and bunnies kind of stuff that coexists with the amazing um, goat scene. Right. Yep. Uh, with uh, with the with the ghost wife and the and the ghost or, and the goat husband who is dead and just like all right well we can't be emotional about, about the fact that I have to eat them because life needs to go on just stating yes. very very clearly and you know through that simplicity having an emotional complexity of its own because of the way it's delivered uh, that you know the, like those things coexisting at the same time it's kind of maddening because you want something that kind of exists mostly on the valence of the goat scene but then but then doesn't because it has to revert to a mean those are always little bits that jump out uh you know yeah. andrew mentioned chrono trigger right like and chrono trigger has some stuff that you on but there's nothing in chrono trigger as elegant as you're healed but you're still hungry uh-huh you know like that that is as as elegant as that game gets yes that is that is a sophisticated idea it 
tells you something really interesting about that world and stuff, mm-hmm. but it's right next to people who just say the things out loud yeah, uh, and process it for you. Like it's next to characters shoving Dambi, Bambi's mom in your face mm-hmm. and like, it's okay. It's for kids, but I'm not a kid, you uh-huh. know? So like the, that is the difference. Like the things that uh, there's plenty of media that's for kids, like whether something is intended for kids or adults is not the operative factor as to whether I, I think it's good or whether it works for me. It's mm-hmm. whether it engages in that shoving Bambi's mom in your face. Absolutely simplest carb that you could ever imagine. Yeah. You know, breakdown thing. Uh, and when, when there are bright lights and dark shadows, like in uh Terra Enigma or Chrono Trigger, like really cool moments that hint at something that is a more complicated carb that makes the, the moments where the King lives in the castle, like, absolute simple baby shit mm-hmm. really stand out. Yeah. Uh, at least to me. Um, yeah. And it's just like how, how, how much, how much do you need to force yourself to have patience for that or to evaluate it for the time? You know, earlier we talked about like, okay, we're not going to do kingdom hearts because nobody would have fun for that. A certain, uh, you know, amount of that is also like, uh, no matter how much I do, I cannot make it so that I played this for the first time when I was 10. Yeah. Right. Yep. And there are people, you know, who have carried Kingdom Hearts with them for most of their life who played the first one in 2002 because they were 10 and they were born five years after me. Right? Or the, the signifiers of Kingdom Hearts were things that they had at that point. And right. what they're doing is they're reliving something mm-hmm. you know they grew up loving aladdin so when aladdin is on screen it reminds them of the, when they were younger and things were simpler yeah you know and and that's a a very specific feeling that they're trying to recapture mm-hmm. um and and i i get that as a thing like i i understand that intellectually uh, it's a thing it's really hard for me to access even with things i do love right you know like there end up being other way other avenues in which i have to love something Mm -hmm. on top of it so like i watched labyrinth all the time as a kid uh i really love labyrinth i can still watch that movie but now my appreciation has morphed as opposed to just being like ah this is what simple times were like Mm -hmm. it's more like isn't this fucking weird yeah you know what is the ecology of these things like i'm asking (laughs) questions and appreciating it in a different way that has grown up with me like it supports that in a way that like Bug snacks. If you take away the gameplay of Bug snacks, and you take away the weird, the twist, mm-hmm. if that were just a like a cartoon that had these little cartoon animals and stuff, it wouldn't carry that that same kind of legacy. I don't think. Yeah, like it's just goofy cartoons that don't make jokes. It's the, it's the fun time Grumpuses. The fun time Grumpus corner. Yeah. 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 The best children's movie, the other thing that I think uh, that differentiates, not with video games so much, but just generally good children's mm-hmm. entertainment, like you talked about DreamWorks and how, uh, you know, they they put in some stuff for adults, you know, in there. But my favorite children's movies remember, or media remembers that kids are funny. Yes. You know, you know like kid, kids have a kid logic that's real fun and funny. Yeah. Uh, and if you tap into that, uh, that kind of breakneck like almost golden age comics, like thing. It's a big, a big adventure time thing. Yeah. Like yeah. an internal logic that is consistent, but really, really off the wall and really fast paced mm-hmm. uh, in a, in a kid way that also is timeless. Yeah. You know, like that, that just is good. Like that's funny, you know, no who he is. <laughs> the, 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 this is this is going to sound like a wild point that I'm going to make, uh, but uh, there are two shows that were marketed as kind of adult animation. You know, like mm-hmm. they came. You know, it was, it was evening time slots, um, but and they're they're kind of made by the same made by the same people. But I think it actually func- function as very good children's media, uh, home mm-hmm. movies, and Bob's Burgers. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. both both made by Lauren Bouchard, right? But like home movies, like all those actors are adults. You know, it's Br- Br- Brendan Small and H. John Benjamin, uh, you know, p- playing the majority of those characters. Uh, but like it remembers that these are kids. And sometimes they talk like adults, but sometimes he asks, they're at spaghetti night and he's asking the mom for shaky cheese because yeah. he doesn't want to say a Parmesan. It's sh- shaky cheese, right? Yeah. Bob's Burgers, there's very little that's actually adult about that, but it is very much, you know, it like I always talk about that as a show about people, you know, the characters who like each other and listen to each other, but also those kids are funny like kids are. Yes. 
Yeah, that, no, that's a, that, that's a really great example of that. Yeah. And that's a really great example of the differentiation between something being kid-friendly without being uh, edgy. Yes. At all. Like, I, I watched a couple episodes of Bob's, Bob's Burgers this weekend, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's a show with no edges on it, which yep. I like. Like, mm-hmm. it it is, it's in the King of the Hill spirit of being, like, good, soft comedy. Yeah. You know, and, and that that's, yeah, that's an important distinction. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that is a good example also, I think, of kid stuff that is just, like, well-written gags. No. Uh, or the Lego movies, which I've talked about before. Mm-hmm. I think those are those are funny. Uh, those have a complicated carb in terms of messaging, or at least the first one does. Yes. You know, but the jokes are not written. It's not they're not sprinkling in adult jokes. It's mm-hmm. not just like let's throw some double entendres <laughs> in there. It just feels like it's written by people who know how to write jokes. Yes, you know they're aimed at a, a, a kid kind of audience, but they're not like here's the farting squirrel who can't hold on to all his nuts is not that farting <laughs> squirrel funny like in some ways we're talking about just different levels of kids yeah you probably. know like like babies <laughs> you know the, the, the grumpus gang feel like it's a cartoon for babies uh-huh. to me not like just lower teens or tweens right you know and I mean, and and then there's also uh, like we talk about Adventure Time, but like Adventure Time was a show that felt like it grew up with its audience to yeah. a degree as well. You know, like it always was, you know, just at, at its at its heart, a very well put together fantasy world that kind of started in a place and then spiraled and filled in more detail about cosmology as it went. And as its characters, I think, kind of became equipped to think about and address it and ultimately mm-hmm. ultimately became something very different from where from, from where it started out. But like running that spectrum also talks about, you know, kind of address what you just said, like it's you know, different kind of kids and who's named at, you know, and that same thing happened with video games compare Final Fantasy four to Final Fantasy seven or even eight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And 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 that is to be, you know, to be uh lauded to me. Yeah. I, I want that. Like I there are things that I do have like I have nostalgia for Final Fantasy IV. Mm-hmm. I like the melodrama, that story and the pace. I like the characters. I played it as a kid, the sound effects and music and stuff. Like it it, it will transport me in that yeah. way. I can't pretend like the Golbez reveal or Zeromus flying out of nowhere or Fosu Ya are particularly great storytelling. Mm-hmm. And as games have moved on and and gotten more complicated, like you never hear us complaining about children's media with Super Mario Brothers. Right. Which is definitively children's media. Mm-hmm. Like that, uh, and it's because play is has an inherent timelessness to it that talking doesn't. Yep. And a difference between like going back to a final fantasy four rather than going back to something that's aimed, maybe pitched a little bit higher, but still is angsty and simple carby is the amount of dialogue in it and yeah. opportunities in which it has to talk down to the audience and spell out things that more confident media and better children's media lets children pick up on naturally. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, words are the enemy of this kind of thing. Uh, it, it definitely, you know, again, bug snacks, great example of that. Mm-hmm. Like those characters, uh, a big reason why that doesn't work is, uh, you know, why it feels too much like kids media to me is that all the characters talk and make the simplest possible jokes nonstop, mm-hmm. you know, just like I'm a Valley girl, I'm a hippie, uh, just riff a little bit and say some stuff around that. You're, you're, you're taking too many shots, bud. Yeah. <laughs> yep. like, it's kind of, kind of, I mean, like, yeah, you know, it does kind of doesn't matter. Like if a few of them hits, you're taking so many shots. Yeah. And I, I would rather just, you know, my, the, my prospectus in media in general is I'd rather just not have a bunch of, I don't want, uh, like a thing where there's a couple of adult jokes sprinkled into a bunch of farting squirrels who can't hold on to a big pile of acorns. I'd rather just have the good jokes for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't like, uh, not as bad as it could be as a, as a, (laughs) as like a, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Appalette you put on something. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times with kids 
media that it feels like that's what's happening like well yeah and and also just like oh you know like you have to lower your expectations to you know to meet this thing you know it's just it's it's just as you know not impossible but like it is unreasonable to expect me to manufacture nostalgia for something that i was not around to get that base feeling for you know Mm -hmm. you know to, to to let incubate and it's unreasonable to ask me i think to uh you know uh, let's let, let, let's say round more than is reasonable just because something is putatively aimed at some somebody else because you can or you know a different kind of person or a younger person uh because you can just you can just say that about something you can just say this isn't for you and yeah. therefore everything you have to say about it isn't valid <laughs> yeah. when, it's it's a real like duck feed it's it's a big part of our shared philosophical venn diagram of like yeah. knowing that it's okay for something to exist and not be for us and not be aimed at us and just have that be fine. Like yeah. that is, that's a, a big duck feed thing on multiple axes. And it's one that I think of with this too. So like when somebody, you know, sells a, a, a children's piece of media to me and they're doing it based on like, well, if you think of it like a children's piece of media, it's actually pretty good by that mm. standard. I don't, uh, I have no obligation, but I also have no uh, interest or uh, kind of motivation to change my standards for yeah. that thing. Like I might on the plus side, I might glean some enjoyment mm-hmm. out of it. Uh, at the other side, though, I could just glean my enjoyment out of something else. Yeah. Enjoy like the the I'm going to die someday with a pulse post scarcity world and there being unlimited <laughs> entertainment makes is fixes this. Yeah. You know, it's okay if I miss out on that. Like, Mm -hmm. it's possible, you know, if we didn't do it for work, right? Like, somebody could be like, oh, the Sonic movie is actually really good as far as children's media and a video game adaptation. I don't have a kid. I would never (laughs) see in that. Yeah, I'm not a kid and I don't have a kid. And if I had never seen that, if I couldn't make work out of that, I would not have regretted it. Even though, Mm -hmm. like, there are things I liked about that movie. I would have been just fine. Yeah. You know, me me conforming myself to that was work that I was not rewarded for, uh, you know, other than the literal way I was rewarded for it because I did it for work. If that makes sense. Yeah. Wasted effort. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that also to get back to Andrew's uh, question here, what are the ramifications of this on uh, the game medium, positive or negative? Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, there's a critical mass of people who have stayed in the hobby who experienced something like uh, the Ocarina of Time again at the golden age of video games, which is 12. Uh, mm-hmm. and I'm one of those people. Uh, no, I was, no, I was, I was, I was 11 when I played that anyway. Uh, regardless, <laughs> you probably could let that one slide, man. I probably I, I, could have. It would have been okay. <laughs> I probably would have been okay. Sorry. Uh, I got fixated on the numbers. I thought you were, I thought you were gonna say, like, oh, I was six or something like that. I thought it was gonna be a big difference. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> nope. It's uh, within the margin of error. It, it is within the margin of error. I, I, I think that uh, uh, enough people experienced it at the golden age of video games, one of them anyway, which is which is 12, and has therefore caused them to, I think, loom much larger uh, over over the industry and mm-hmm. kind of uh, the, the, the output than I think they that I think they ought to have. Uh, and I think that uh, that has caused, uh, you know, a lot of, I don't know, like it's, it's a stagnating force. Let's say it, 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 you have your Chris Kohler's of the world saying that what's wrong with fight magic item. Right. You know, and that is, that is a stagnating force. Yeah. Uh, in that thing, there's nothing wrong with a, a appreciating a, a simplicity, but kind of pushing for it, like pushing against innovation is weird, you know, and, and it get, they, they spirals out into all kinds of things. I pump the brakes on that that thread before I get too far on it, but like <laughs> it does have a stagnating effect. One of the, like, uh, you know, my good friend, Will, who I talk about, about video games with a lot, even though it doesn't end up on the network, mm-hmm. uh, he is much more nostalgic for a lot of this stuff. Like he loves Chrono Trigger and stuff, but he has the perfect attitude about all this stuff is just like, why would I replay it? Uh-huh. Like he just leaves the stuff in the past. And I think that's really smart. Mm-hmm. Like kids media that you experienced as a kid and worked for you as a kid, you don't have to take that with you. Um, you know, like it, it doesn't have to influence your taste or influence things that are coming later. Like you had that experience as a kid. It was four kids. That's awesome. Yep. Like <laughs> let that live in the past. You still have it. Uh-huh. 
you know, uh, the, the kind of sweaty attempt to recapture the feelings of that you had as being a kid mm-hmm. uh, that you have, like, I just feel like there are probably better ways to process that. Yeah. Um, you know, and for me, when I have gone back to those things, typically I'm just disappointed and angry. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and it, it doesn't serve me to go back. Yeah. It doesn't, it, it not only is it something that I think philosophically is, is more true to what I, I think, but it also is practically better for me. Yeah. We, 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 we got a few responses about Metal Gear Solid five, you know, with people talking about, uh, you know, the inertia of affection for the series, especially mm-hmm. because it hit them at particular times and their times in their life, you know, probably you know, earlier than it probably should have, but just like, Oh yeah, I associate it, you know, like, yeah, just a, like, wow. Like with being a teen and being down for it, uh, just being a real pay pig for Kojima stuff. And it's like the way that I conceptualize it is like that person that you are is still in there because the adult that you are kind of grew around the kid that you were <laughs> to a mm-hmm. degree, you know, like that's still in there. Uh, it is, it is surgery to get in there to, 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 to that kid sometimes. Yeah. And that cannot be that that's invasive. And, you know, there's the, 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 there, there can be collateral tissue damage and stuff from going at it. Um, and you can just kind of rest confident knowing that the person who enjoyed that at that time is still in there and don't necessarily need to dig in and, uh, reevaluate because there's a chance that you might not, you know, rummage around your guts and and pull out the the bomb. No time for anesthesia. It was a clean cut. (laughs) Close her up. Uh, the, uh, it's also, uh, this is a bigger subject, but it does go into a general stagnation. Uh, that yeah. that has to do with being a fan of something because you have that inertia. Yeah. You know, we talked about this when we did the let it die topic, but like, you know, you, you came upon silent Hill at a specific time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so silent Hill has a, a magical cachet for you, even though that series, you know, died. If you want to nurture that kid, uh, just find things that stand up that you still like in as adult mm-hmm. uh, that do those things without, thinking that it, the magic words of silent hill are what's going to re- reveal that yeah you know don't undignify yourself begging for a bloober team silent hill remake <laughs> instead just do the work of processing what you like about the thing mm-hmm. and then look for those things yeah uh the the when when that process goes wrong you uh harass people off of the internet uh because mm-hmm. they were involved in making a star wars that didn't make you 10 years old again it, exactly and it's 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 a it that kind of behavior, you know, like I'm philosophically against it, but it has real effects too. Yeah. Like, you know, people listening to this don't necessarily harass anybody. Like, I like to hope that we've curated an audience that's better than that. Please. But this this thing that we're talking about, this kind of recapturing your childhoodness can lead to significant toxicity yeah. and real harm and uh, being a worse person. It doesn't have to, but mm-hmm. it can. Uh, so it's, it's kind of serious stuff to you. It's not just a, a preference thing. Yeah. Very complicated. Like the, the has tendrils and a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we're not gonna get to all of it, but I feel like that's good. I think that's now. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's plenty. Uh, thanks everybody for writing in. We appreciate you. Mm-hmm. If you would like to write in, if you would like to join us for one of these episodes, keep an eye out for the, uh, you know, patrons get to ask questions. Um, mm-hmm. We put a post up. If you join us at patreon.com slash duckfeed TV, uh, you can do so. Yeah. You can ask us a question, suggest the topic. If your question didn't get read, uh, it, we will talk about it in a roundup, mm-hmm. most likely. Uh, it's just for time and stuff. It's not a, uh, it's not personal. Yeah. Uh, those roundups happen uh, once per, qu- per quarter. Wach-ah! Yeehaw. Yep. Yeehaw. And you have to be a patron to listen to those as well, which we think we provide a lot of value there. Uh, mm-hmm. And you support your boys. You do. If you are a marginalized creator, by which I mean non-white, non-cis, non-dude, non-straight, uh, and you'd like to get uh, us to highlight your project, you can send me an email at gary at duckfeed.tv. Um, this month, uh, I'm highlighting some work by Damian Crawford, who is making a video game called Purgatory Dungeoneer. Mm. Um, if you look this up on Steam, this looks amazing. Uh this is uh, the person who is working with them to, to get this game out, reached out to me. So this is not somebody who is in dire straits or anything like that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's worth noting, like, I want to draw attention to, you know, it's not the idea of just people who are, have no, no resources. 
mm-hmm. you know, I just want to throw some people, you know, throw some eyes at, at people who are not, def- you know, us. Yeah. Um, but this game looks incredible. So I wanted to talk about it anyway. Um, Purgatory Dungeoneer, incredible aesthetics. Uh, tell me this sentence uh, doesn't seem good. Purgatory Dungeoneer, a.k.a. my grandpa died and all he left me was this one dungeon in a purgatory filled with uh, dungeon in purgatory filled with nihilistic adventures is a roguelike RPG about plundering a psychic helm off for personal closure. Uh, <laughs> and the, the aesthetic of it is incredible. Uh, I have wishlisted it. Um, um, wow. Wishlisted as well. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, on Steam, planned release date, pending humanity's survival. <laughs> yep. Very, very, uh, very cool. Oh, there's a city bit so the city builder element to this too. Like yep. a like a kind of a darkest dungeon kind of thing. You go Shit. yeah, you go into a basement and you uh do RPG roguelike stuff with this uh-huh. like very cool old DOS aesthetic, yeah. and then that influences the city you build above with individual citizens. Uh, recruit over 400 former adventurers to plunder the helm off or resources. Um, uh, it looks badass. Yeah, that that uh, looks really good. Yeah. So uh, that is our our project uh, from Damian Crawford, mm-hmm. um, being uh, being published uh, by uh, who is a strange scaffold who has mm-hmm. published big stuff. So again, Damian is not necessarily in dire straits. All uh-huh. I'm not. Also, the reality of indie game publishing is tough. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a it's a, a big time publisher. But we also I think it looks cool. Yeah. I want to talk about it. Uh, if you have something you'd like us to to do, send me an email. That uh, the developer, I don't know if Damien has been been involved in that, but um, uh, Cannibal Interactive, they have a few things out on Steam as well. All of which kind of have this kind of lo fi uh, DOS like aesthetic, which looks pretty cool to me. It looks real good. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's read some responses. Let's do, uh, starting with Bug Snacks. Gordon says, But Bug Snacks gave me a vision into a world where Eurojank games somehow became a genre and received a mirror shine. While physics based puzzlers are never going to work quite perfectly, uh, but when the elements of those puzzles are honking idiot food monsters making mouth sounds, then solving a problem due to <laughs> three stoogy and chaos rather than cleverness kind of fits with the tone. Somehow the janky pieces work together and we dip out just before the empire, the entire pile of nonsense collapses under its own weight. I, I think that last bit's a really good point. Mm-hmm. You know, something we talked about in that episode is that like, that game or two hours longer. I think I would like it a lot less. I feel like we say that about most games. No, no, 100%. <laughs> but specifically, I mean, yeah. that is always true, but also bug snacks for yeah. me. Like I liked that game. So, you know, somebody was cranky cause we didn't do more stuff in the game. I, uh, I liked that game. They're mm-hmm. like, Oh, I can't believe oh, it's fine. That you guys didn't like this, but you should have done more of it. And I'm like, well, That's- I did like it. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, and part of why I liked it is because I didn't do more of it. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, uh, what I, I it's I did the product. Mm-hmm. I saw some credits. Yeah, you know? uh, uh, don't I, gerrymander I, I stuff, I weirdos. I didn't know that other stuff was there until yeah. I read about it later. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> but I, I the idea that this uh, it gets in and out before it collapses under its own weight is is really true. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shelby says, hi y'all. I've been listening for a long time, but this is the first time I've listened to the episode and played the game recently enough to comment on it much. My boyfriend and I started playing bug snacks because I saw it was included in the PS plus games catalog. I remember hearing some hype about it from friends. Well, I don't think I'll finish the game. The couple of hours of cute bug hunting definitely made our night specifically though. I explained the twist to my boyfriend before playing and while helping a character early on, he turns to me and goes, these guys suck. <laughs> expect me to do their chores and feed them i'm so glad these gluttonous fucks are going to die i couldn't agree more hashtag down with grumpuses <laughs> down with fuck, grumpuses indeed fuck these gluttonous fucks <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um uh, you know we talk of it it, uh, it feels like a previous episode we episode we kind of hit on a game being perfect for um game pass uh, mm-hmm. uh, carrion uh, carrion we yeah. talked about that and just the uh, the idea of there this being free on playstation plus for anybody who was subscribed at the time as, you know around the time of the ps5 launch i think also uh, oh, uh yeah. has some it has so much to do with the reception of the game yep and just the idea of treating it like a movie like oh i'm looking for something to play for the a couple hours yep yeah yeah 
Uh, Nervous writes, glad the announcement of September schedule finally gave me the push to hop on bug snacks. Uh, I was surprised to find a slightly softer take on developer Yoshiro Kimura's Steez, particularly Moon or Tulip. Explore an offbeat community of lovable weirdos, solve puzzles to collect all the little monsters, and eventually engage with some darkly comedic existential horror. Moon and Chulip are two of my favorite games, uh, but they fall down in uh, they fall down in that many of their collect em up collect em up puzzles are so obscure and are nonsensical that you'll have a much better time uh, uh, playing either of those games with a guide close at hand. Bug Snacks makes a much needed improvement by providing enough clues and environmental language for you to figure out how to capture the snacks on your own. Uh, there were definitely a few that I had to look up how to wrangle, but I never felt like the solutions didn't make sense. It's a clever and pleasurable little game. P.S. Uh, you guys were talking about Skittlebrow adjacent drinks on Adric Suffering. When I was 18 and didn't really understand drinking, I tried to make a cocktail of Bailey's mm. and Coke. Uh, when the Coke hit the Bailey's, the glass erupted into a curdled froth of thick green foam. Uh, many of uh, Many of it or sorry, most of it got on the table, uh, but uh, what stayed in the glass smelled and tasted like hell. Have a grand old day. I, I was going to, as a joke, ask how it tasted, but I'm very proud because <laughs> Nervous did taste it, which I would have done as well. Well, you got to. <laughs> yeah. Like, if I you know burst out a glass for this, I got to know. <laughs> it, yeah uh this is uh the, the, this is primarily why it's a it's a distasteful name uh but the irish car bomb it never made sense to me oh, i tried delicious. making one of them I, I know they're delicious but i can't drink it fast enough before it curdles oh yeah that's that's the trick uh yeah. it's it tastes so good if they made a soda that tasted like that mm-hmm. um the uh i always want to be the, the the i i admire the kind of gamer who likes moon like <laughs> I don't like moon. I, I, you know, when it, uh, yeah, but I, I, I want to be the kind of person who, who likes that, but I can't handle moon. Mm -hmm. Uh, I find find it annoying. I, I, I got it when it was re-released, but I haven't touched it. A kind of out of hesitation that I will not care for it either. Like mm-hmm. it is, it is a game. I, I don't line up with Bob Mackie on everything, but like his, the complete adoration of it for me has like translated into like, this is a good thing that is worth attention, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm worried that it, that it won't land for me. I, I think that it would have been really cool if I had played it when it came out. Yeah. Like I would have been very impressed by the subversions and stuff like that. But as a, other than as a historical artifact, I couldn't get through it. Mm-hmm. I, I started playing it and I'm like, I, I have, but the back of my neck feels hot. I'm, I'm too annoyed playing yeah. this. Um, but uh, I, I think yeah. that, uh, the, the, that that developer, uh, Kimura, yeah, Onion, uh, his iOS games are uh, really good. What what is uh, what have they done on iOS? Uh, oh my gosh, Dandy Dungeon uh, is, a, oh, is a fun one. Okay, yeah, I've heard good yeah. things about that, but I haven't played it. Mm, fun little puzzle game. Yeah. Nice. How much of uh, spending time in a town with weirdos is it? Because I, th- oh, I think wow. that might be the aspect that I'm not. Absolutely not. Oh, yeah. great. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's quirky, but it's mechanics focused. Good. Like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is me, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to Metal Gear Solid 5, uh, Andrew says, uh, I know people like to rag on Kojima for his lack for the lack of depth of approaching media, but I want to complain about a different element of his work that is often pr- he's praised for, cinematography. The man seems to fully understand that there is a potential in the video game medium to break the rules of film cinematography in terms of movement and depth of field, but is unable to restrain himself when it comes to using this. Metal Gear Solid 5 and Death Stranding are unwilling to ever let the camera pause. Why let a moment linger when you could do a dramatic zoom, swinging turn, or out-of-touch Dutch angle? The camera's constant movement removes tension from the piece rather than adding to it, as there is nothing to compare any other shot to. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. The only thing that I have to say about it is, uh, like so many things, Death Stranding is a step in the right direction, and hopefully it implies a trajectory. Yeah. I Somebody was talking about Death Stranding in the Slack. Uh, and told me how it opens. Uh, and that was, I, I mean, I wasn't going to play it and I know you're not suggesting I play it. Like I'm not yeah. saying this defensively at you, mm-hmm. but it was, uh, another nail in the pile of nails that is covering up the coffin <laughs> uh, for that. I was like, Oh, it begins, it begins with a Jeep ride. It begins with a skull Jeep ride of somebody explaining 
uh, things to your character that they would already know. Great. Uh, I, I, I can, you know, I, I don't recall that. <laughs> so, Appar- I mean, yeah. again, this is all hearsay cause I didn't play it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it begins with somebody explaining to, you know, about how connection is lost and the right, mega cities right. are all separate to a character who knows it in the back of a Jeep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Warren writes, uh, I'm so glad you guys have finally covered this game. It's one of my favorite games of all time. And the first waft that I listened to was metal gear solid Two. hearing your thoughts on the first episode, um, address a lot of the issues that I have with the game. Uh, Kojima gets something in his head and has to beat it into the audience's head until it loses all meaning. While I also love death stranding, he repeats this, uh, there with the extinction entity part of the story. I feel like I look back at this game with rose colored glasses because I was very caught up with the hype. Say what you will about his games. Kojima is a phenomenal trailer designer. Uh, I was so caught up in the hype that I had no problem playing through 95% of the game a second time uh, during launch week. Uh, because I got the bug where if you had quiet with you for mission 29 metallic Archaea, it broke your save and you couldn't get the full ending. Jesus. Mm. Uh, Every time I've tried to go back for a full playthrough since beating the game, I've always stalled out because despite being as close to perfect in the hands as the game has ever felt, there is so much friction and unnecessary time uh, spent on the uninteresting parts of this game. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. I, 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 I like the number of ideas that Warren is able to hold in their head. The, uh, I don't know. I wish I, there's something I wish I had read before we recorded that, uh, mm-hmm. that went around the slack uh, in the wake of that episode, yeah. which is the hardcore gaming one one interview with the, uh, localizer. Oh uh, yeah. Metal Gear solid two that, uh, 4chan tried to get her fired for or killed for. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, it may, I've never felt more vindicated and good, uh-huh. uh, reading a thing. It's, it is a dessert. It's a dessert made of words. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I recommend reading it. Uh, and it is a lot of just things that makes me feel less alone in the world. Like yeah. what is up with this guy having this weird fetish for American militarism, which he has knows nothing about. Mm-hmm. Why does he care that much about this? Yeah. You know, uh, great question. No <laughs> answers. Great question. But the, the thing I, w- I was going to say with, uh, with coach about him hammering those ideas, one of the things that, uh, cause the, the a joke I keep making on Slack is if I can't convince people not to play his games, I can convince them that he's a bad person. <laughs> uh, which I, I only half kidding. Okay. He's a bad person. All of his games are sexist. He's been doing it for 30 years. That's enough to make you a bad person. Right. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. uh, if you just have shitty, dumb idiot women for 30 years of game and you never get better at it, mm-hmm. uh, that is bad person material. Um, but he blames his localizers for everything. Like yeah. it is a weird, like not only is he a shit bag and creatively bankrupt, he's, really mean to his staff and stuff like some of these stories are blood curdling i can't i i i can't brook that yeah yeah it's awful you know and then with people he the the localizer of middle gear solid one which is really popular like largely considered to be like the most streamlined and you know digestible narrative that he's mm-hmm. ever done uh he hate he like he is really critical of the localizer yeah for that for not doing it ju- like his grand idea is justice. It's so Mark Borchardt shit. <laughs> uh, it, just incredible. Yeah. So again, bad person, bad mm. person. Uh, <laughs> he, like, not you for liking him, uh-huh. but he is a bad person. I like Lovecraft. He's a bad person. Yep. Uh, Kojima rotten human being <laughs> room to improve. Yes. At yeah. uh, at best. Uh, Chase says, uh, it was 2013. And I was 12 years old when I bought Metal Gear Solid 3. And I'll never forget it because I bought Dark Souls at the same time, the game that would eventually lead me to you guys. I'll just say that I was blown away. The tiny gameplay gimmicks were mind blowing uh, to me, as well as the chaotically ridiculous narrative. Fast forward two years, and I was a mega fan full of hype for the Phantom Pain. I absolutely loved it. The updating of gameplay to a modern feel was amazing. The support for multiple playstyles felt so lovingly crafted and led me to replay multiple missions at the same time. I didn't understand the narrative really more than I'm a mercenary guy. I tended to skip cutscenes and read later, but the moment where I had to put down, um, put my soldiers down as they saluted me really choked me up in the moment. 
Looking back now, Kojima's flaws are much more annoying now that I appreciate maturity and responsibility in my literature. And the controversy be- between him and Konami also really saddens me because I would have loved the finished game with all three chapters. However, I still think this is an amazing game and one of the best in class for action stealth games. Yeah. Agree with that last bit. If they, if somebody did a mod of this that just stripped out all the words and I could just fire up like almost like a proc gen mission, <laughs> like in this map, go to this, 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 you know, base you, and do this thing. You want the chalice dungeons. Yeah. I want a chalice dungeon for this game and I would play the shit out of them. Mm-hmm. Like it would be really good for that. That might be metal gear survive. I know someday yeah. <laughs> we, we, we have to add it to our, our list with dark souls two and uh resident evil six <laughs> yeah, these, as the black these, sheep lovers the, the, these crazy redemptions i'm i'm perfectly fine being the black sheep lover chrono yeah. cross all the way man <laughs> yeah, there you go is chrono cross i feel like got a big reevaluation. is that a black sheep like a lot of yeah, people, i think yeah, I, no, I don't like chrono no, cross, no, but a lot of people it, like it it's it's still it's it's still a black sheep is it okay uh, yeah like it got that it got that re-release and that's cool from like a pres- preservation standpoint. But like I've not seen somebody who disliked it before play that and be like, oh my god, this is genius. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well that, that that happens very rarely though, too. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh let's see here. Riley says, uh, as someone who's a big fan of the story and characters of Metal Gear, I hated the move away from the codec towards the audio tapes. Not because I thought the codec was perfect. There were a lot of issues. Conversations ran too long, and Kojima has always been a writer who needs an editor behind him. But codec calls had to end, had to get back to gameplay, uh, at least tried to be relevant to characters in the moment. With the tapes, I needed the audio of the guards and uh, radio chatter admissions, so I couldn't listen naturally as I played. Um, I had to set aside time for them. It was the car with skull face writ large. Uh, I think this issue is best seen with the tapes that you get after the ending. An hour of tapes talking about motivations, tying dots on whiteboards together. A lot of facts uh, tacked on with no character or thematic weight. Why do the tapes exist? Who recorded them? How does Big Boss get them? Who knows? Those vinyl tapes are themselves trying to patch up four, making your squad from three the Patriots. Seeing two loose ends and tying them together, even if it makes both weaker. Uh, Kojima is a writer who I think mistakes quality of narrative with having a complete equation. Yeah. Like a, a high quality narrative explains everything. Mm-hmm. That is that is all that's required for a high quality narrative. Like is a complicated plot where if you wrote it out as a math equation, it would work. Doesn't matter what's in there, mm-hmm. it just has to work. So making the the your support crew from three, the Patriots, nobody likes that idea. Nope. Like even Metal Gear fans, like everybody hates that. Uh it was done for, you know, what I believe would probably be like a shocking, you know, just a shock value. Mm-hmm. But then he thinks that because it's justified narratively, it is therefore a good idea. Mm-hmm. That's what I think he was getting at with the words and deeds stuff with quiet. Yeah. Him, the idea to to him with his mind of a child, the idea of somebody <laughs> not liking a choice because they don't like the choice is translated to him to mean they don't like it because it's not accounted for. So when he said words and deeds, he was like, no, 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 it's accounted for without Mm -hmm. understanding that it doesn't matter that it's accounted for. It just fucking sucks. Yeah. And I think I I understand the choice. I just don't get it. Yeah. I just, and also don't (laughs) like it. (laughs) That's what I mean. I understand the choice, but I just don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that really explains a lot of his, complicated corkboard plotting and stuff Mm -hmm. like it's not about the quality of making the choice it's about the stunt of narratively justifying it and that being enough and being confused for storytelling i mean it's the it it is the thing that makes metal gear for metal metal gear solid for poison yeah. Uh, well, you know, that and the, you know, just completely inconsistent play uh, and the from, sex mission, squad. From, from mission to mission. Oh, also the Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, sex, uh, I mean, the sexy lady the, boss the, squad. The, well, there's lots of stuff. Metal Gear Solid 4 is so much like watching any Saw movie after three. Mm. Um, uh, it it kind of becomes a little bit. It's, it's like a stunt. Like I went back and replayed Metal Gear Solid 4 after I played Metal Gear me five because i wanted to get, get a lead in to play revengeance because i you know hadn't just now? hadn't finished revengeance no no this was several oh. years ago this was okay, back was in like, like 20 20- yeah since, this, since this- the last time we recorded Metal Gear solid five you've done 
<laughs> like like two other Metal Gear games? <laughs> I follow yeah. your Twitter. I know you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is back like 2016. Okay? Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that, would, that would be some psycho shit yeah. but like I, I like i went back to it also like kind of for that saw like continuity porn like okay it's a stunt like what kind of debate shit are you going to do to try and square these things because yes. i know you're gonna because you cannot you compulsively cannot let something hang it, it's not just a compulsion i think it's what he thinks a good story is well yes you know it, but it, you're right about that and that is that's a, a specific cilantro gene you know, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned, I, I really liked the, yeah, when you talked about that and you compared it to 999 and said like the, the incredibly intricate, but barely, you know, clock that doesn't keep good time. Mm-hmm. Cause I think it's a really useful metaphor yeah, for a, a type of thing to appreciate, you mm-hmm. know, that doesn't work for me in games, but works for me in some other stuff mm-hmm. and is really an apt description of a lot of art. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, is this me? Yes, this is you. Yeah. Uh, Nick says, the character of Quiet may be the dumbest, most hateful thing. Hey, that segues really well. Uh, <laughs> words and deeds. Maybe the dumbest, most hateful thing Kojim has ever put into his games. Beyond the whole moronic skin breathing uh, equals constant nudity thing, she spends the entire game beha- behaving like a feral animal. I vividly recall a scene where the player returns to Mother Base and is greeted uh, by a scene of Quiet violently attacking one of your soldiers and cutting his mouth open with a knife. We're told that the soldier did something to uh, to her, implied sexual harassment, but Quiet makes no attempt to explain her actions or even distinguish her behavior from a murderous beast. Frankly, I would have executed her then and there if the game had allowed it. Later, we learn that she fully understands English, but cannot speak it because of magical language-eating parasites. But the parasite wouldn't stop her from being able to hold a pen. Even uh, pointing and grunting would have been a major improvement. Or Agreed. learning any kind of language. There's ASL. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my little Pokemon robot guys in the base t- pass each other's languages like fucking STDs. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the theme of the game. She speaks one Navajo. The, she speaks yeah, one when, of the most difficult and rare languages in existence. And I have somebody who speaks Navajo who also speaks English, who would be happy uh-huh. to translate. Yeah. It's because he wanted to have a naked woman mm-hmm. who didn't talk. Like, those <laughs> yeah. are both part of his gross boner mm-hmm. that, that everyone's like, yes, I will pay $60 for this boner. <laughs> Like I, I will, I will slowly jerk Kojima off and then I will believe like nobody doing these responses are, but right, like the right. people who, you know, the person who told me I don't understand art, uh, is just jerking him off and letting him yeah. come in their face. Like <laughs> you just, you're just getting a sloppy smile from old <laughs> no. Kojima. Never say sloppy <laughs> smile. Don't give yourself sloppy smiles for quiet. <laughs> Jesus, man! <laughs> I just like winding you up and watching it go. I'm so mad. <laughs> the, uh, the the that interview has this great bit where it's like, was there anything like what that you would change? And she's like, well, one thing is, I'd say, stop making women characters so stupid. Yeah, yeah. And it's like even before Qu- Quiet, uh, the yeah. characters are real stupid. Mm-hmm. He's, he's not good at women, but he knows that he needs them there because. <laughs> He's seen them in movies. <laughs> uh, uh, Matt says, uh, in the show, you mentioned that for all the cool stuff this game allows you to do in its play, it's also deeply embarrassing. I had the perfect encapsulation of this dichotomy happen to me. I was finishing up a mission where I needed to extract someone. The base was alerted to my presence, and I was hiding in some foliage with the person slung across my back. I saw that I was able to summon my helicopter for extraction inside the enemy base, just across a clearing from where I was trying to hide. I radioed in Pequod, uh, and before long, I could hear the man who sold the world uh, blaring uh, across the distance. I ran to meet my ride as the enemies opened fire on me. Now that I was running across the clearing without any cover, my helicopter filed, fired missiles to cover my escape as I closed the distance. I remember how I happened to pan my camera between the enemies and Pequod and the missiles all at the perfect time as explosions silhouetted my character. I felt so fucking cool. It felt like a pre-rendered cutscene, but I had made it all happen. The interactions in the game all worked together at the perfect moment to create a series of play uh, that was memorable even all these years later. I boarded the copter. Quiet jumped in and I rode off, music still blaring as fires burned below, illuminating the night. 
I have my PlayStation's record button uh, to save it as a video clip. It was a rare video game moment where I actually felt like I had done something impressive looking. I called my then girlfriend over with a, hey, you've got to check out what I just did in this game. She'd always been a little bit frustrated with how much I liked video games and saw it as childish. Boy, I wonder why we split up. Um, I... I played the clip for her, and the final frame that my PS4 had auto-captured was when Quiet entered the helicopter. The angle of the camera just happened to be in the perfect place for her gigantic wet tits to take up the entire (laughs) TV. And that's where it ended and held. My girlfriend just looked at me and said, oh, like I get why you like this game so much and walked away. I never felt whiplash from cool to embarrassed in a game so fast before video games it's not just pac-man anymore (laughs) we also have gigantic wet tits (laughs) that's that that's great i tales of of people being embarrassed to, to bring quiet on missions uh, is very funny to me. It is bad, yeah, no, it was very good. That was that was very well put together, Matt. Thank you. Uh, also, people grinding up, getting her clothes, like not you, and that's a lot of grinding. But like, it's I'm so not going to bring this person on here until they can put on an outfit. Yep. <laughs> like, it's like getting a little kid. Like, we're not going to leave until you put on your coat. And it's like ex- exactly as hard. <laughs> where like, are your shoes? Where, where are your shoes? Your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, the lawyer in review. Where, where he shows up like he's like, I couldn't find my shoes. <laughs> so really under uh, underappreciated part of that show. I just sorry, I just got get it, got gotten really into golf lately. Yeah, I was, my, I was looking at the wrong year. <laughs> my calendar. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, Elias uh, says. I grew up in Costa Rica, a Central American country that a big part of Peace Walker took part in. As a teenager in a small valley town, I lived the open world life of running through coffee fields, hiding away from exploited laborers, and breaking into construction sites to smoke weed on the roof of the soon-to-be mansion of some money laundering mechanic. When Metal Gear Solid V came out, I had moved to the bum of the world, Australia, and was firmly into my second year of art school. I anticipated this game with such passion, and to my delight, it managed to do more than just give me a good open world. It rekindled that feeling I had had as a shitty teen with too much freedom of seeing a mobile telecommunications antenna with its little gazebo in the middle of a forest and coffee fields and deciding that's where I'm going to go drink this weekend. The way I first approached this game, uh, reveling in the purely mechanical joy it gave me, being Kojima pilled, thinking its story uh, made any narrative or thematic sense, clashes heavily with how, nowadays, I have a modicum of understanding of the political and societal conditions that my country has been subjected to, and how badly Kojima handles the subject matter he tackled for almost 30 years. I'm sure in the 300 hours of exposition that Peace Walker has, Kojima included the facts that Costa Rica hasn't had an army since the 1950s and instead using the money to bolster its social security system and protect its natural resources. Yet in game, it's still presented as jungle country number seven and having Paz as the most anime white lady to butcher the words of Galo Pinto. Uh, apologies if, if Gary, I <laughs> it's it's the also, yes. Yeah, if I mispronounced that, uh, I'm also uh, anime white lady who fucked that up. Uh, <laughs> They continue. Uh, I don't think Kojima can handle big political military fiction with the dexterity that most people give him credit for and that most of his use of real history and locations is incredibly superficial and very rarely feels like it has anything worth saying in it Uh, that hasn't been said uh, by every two cent anime uh, that has come out of Japan. Um, Yeah, he's not good at taking things Mm. seriously. I can't imagine what it'd be like to live in a country like I can understand what it is like to be in America. Where we're mm-hmm. um, you know immensely privileged to be in America, and he's just like, oh, the president's a an octopus mech and all this stuff, and it's just silly. But if I lived in one of the countries he had sympathy for, good <laughs> God, like I would probably like that would be really tough if You're- he was evoking anything that meant something to me. Yeah, like it feels like he wants to portray sympathy for Afghanistan, but also nothing we see in Afghanistan is civilization. It's all no ruins and stuff it's like not a a, yeah yeah big desert you know yeah it's very similar to the the you know we're gonna start best quality vacuum and the the breaking bad mexico is yellow yes thing except it's for narrative it's not just an aesthetic Mm -hmm. you know it's just uh yeah that's 
that's distressing. Yeah. Um, we had so many people write in about Metal Gear Solid Five. I'm sorry if your response did, didn't get in, but you know, just uh, it's the way it goes. Time is time. Yeah, this episode's um, running long. Everybody gets some bonus dispatch. Yeah, this uh, this month. Uh, about Carrion here. Uh, Doug writes in saying, "I really wanted to love Carrion more, but I couldn't help but feel disappointed." Uh, it felt like uh, the idea for a play as the thing came first and the gameplay had to be retrofit later. Specifically, the thing is such an overpowered creature uh, that the challenge was artily or that challenge was artificially created uh, with the size based puzzles and an obfuscated map. Perhaps with more time, other play elements uh, would have uh, better balanced the glory thrills of tearing through humans uh, with some modest obstacles. For my money, a better thing game uh, would be a cross between something like Alien Isolation and Hitman. Slink through a base, uh, taking out humans one by one, and pretend to be them without getting caught. Press R2 to Brimley Spider. See, it writes itself. Uh, in all seriousness, I can't say I didn't enjoy aspects of Carrion, and I did beat the game, uh, but I never could shake the feeling that the concept just needed more time in the oven. Oh well, lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Carry on my wayward son. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, agreed. There's agreed. potential here. It wasn't very the thingy. Mm-hmm. And the thing game would have to have social, you know, uh, deduction kind of stuff in it. Yeah. Like, that's what uh, the thing's about. And also, uh, you're making me realize how much Hitman is already basically the thing. It's <laughs> it's very similar. There's Everything goes back to Hitman. Yeah. Like everything we want in a game or whenever we're like, why can't a game be more like this? Uh-huh. It's Hitman 2016 trilogy. Does it? <laughs> yep. Because those yeah. are among the most perfect games ever created. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're perfect miracles. <laughs> yeah. God, that series is good. Yeah. Uh, like I just always on the, the, you know, on the precipice of a replay. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew says, it's odd to me that Carrion was sold as a power fantasy when it's very clearly a 2D stealth game and not really a great one at that. While reaching out a tendril to grab a person or a drone and slamming around can be fun, it often feels arbitrary whether you get the kill or get instantly shredded by bullets. It is also sold as a Metroidvania, and it falls into the most common pitfall, pitfall of the genre. Leaving aside the baffling lack of map, every power other than possession is just a fancy key. In one case, two different powers are just keys for different sides of the same lock. The movement animation is cool, but once you get to the third level of beefiness, it's more trouble than it's worth, as your locus of control is often unclear, and I found myself accidentally going backwards through the suck pipes quite often. Uh, Finally, I have no idea what the actual order of events is in the story, and there are only like three events. (laughs) Uh, I didn't hate all of it, but it seems like some reviewers don't get that a neat concept doesn't always a great game make. Yeah. Yeah. We, We talked about this a lot when we talk about like modern video game reviews and review websites and how like you're under a lot of pressure and you have to constantly turn stuff out. You're under deadlines. I think a lot of people just end up playing a portion of a game and getting that first impression. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, we, uh, what is it? The developer bootcamp thing for Metal Gear Solid five mm-hmm. where everybody had 18 hours to play it in like a luxury resort that they've been taken to, yeah. you know, I don't think that happened with Carrion, but people did just sit down, play it for a while or have to like really rush through it. And they're like, that's neat. It made me feel something. I should write a review based on that without thinking about it very deep. Yeah. And you even know? then it didn't get especially great scores. No. Know? No, it just has that one like absolutely wild outlandish Kotaku review. Um, Kotaku. I said to- Kotaku, which mm. is different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is this, uh, this is you, right? I believe this is me. Uh, Dylan says, hi, y'all. I've been listening since discovering Bonfire Side Chat in 2020. I've downloaded all the episodes of Bonfire Side Chat on WAF, which I listen to when I go hiking and running. When I go for long trips, my girlfriend likes to ask if I'm bringing the boys again. Aw. Normally, I cut out the praise, uh, but I like the idea of us being the boys boys and going on the boys. Yeah, Yeah, look at us. (laughs) Uh, Regarding Carrion, I found this a perfect example of a game whose presentation carried all of its goodwill. The concept is fantastic. Being the monster, controlling like a monster, and acting like a monster. The pixel art puts the gore and gorgeous, and I loved how sinewy the monster felt. 
But even in the short few hours it takes to play this $15 game, it quickly became as stagnant as the chthonic water of the labs. Mm. Um, is it chthonic or chthonic? I think chthonic. Okay. That's how I've always said it, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Despite being a puzzle game, uh, the AI and enemy variety is extremely low. And since you're an amorphous blob with no real head, the direction you choose to go pushes the nearest side toward that direction, which frustrates traveling through tight corridors and avoiding precise enemies. Levels blend together fast, all being mostly the same science light corridors and big rooms, despite evocative level names. This being said, I actually found Leviathan Reef Base an extremely good water level with with clever gating. Uh, It's all just kind of haphazard, uh, as if the developers weren't sure if they wanted an action game or a puzzle game, with an incomplete realization of both, despite landing on a striking theme of being lost, afraid, and monstrous. Even then, I found the presentation itself fairly shallow. One issue I couldn't get past was uh, is certainly a pedantic one, uh, but one important to me as a lover of language. Flora and fauna would be referred to as cyclopean, which doesn't make sense at all, as cyclopean refers to a style of architecture and was the exclusive definition used by Lovecraft, or extremely unimaginably large, which isn't represented in the game proper. Calling moss antediluvian feels weird, too, given that the word means extremely old-fashioned and refers to before the biblical flood in Genesis. These sound nitpicky, uh, but they're demonstrative of a game that took the essence and presentation as Cthulhu-flavored salad dressing rather than a coherent uh, dish of mange rather than a (laughs) coherent dish of uh, maybe that was autocorrect i don't understand (laughs) a coherent dish of mange is very powerful yeah Uh, (laughs) (laughs) it's a very powerful phrase that is yeah um uh uh, so they finish saying thanks for covering had a lovely fall and i look have a lovely lovely fall and look forward to bringing you on the next adventure it's very sweet like i know i've known people have like listen to us on road trips and stuff but the idea of the boys come along an adventure uh-huh very sweet the, the rest of that is very well observed too i'm just charmed by that turn of phrase yes yeah uh, I, yeah i just agreed. like the, the idea of yeah. being the boys continue some of the some of the language stuff might be uh esl stuff not not trying to you know excuse it it Maybe. still ends up being awkward and like localization yeah, and translating yeah. is is good mm-hmm. uh you know but it's a uh, there, there are a lot of things to nitpick yeah. uh, in this. I'm glad we had two responses in a row uh, in my brain addled haze. I think we talked about this, uh-huh. but uh, when you're big, it being like really, really hard to navigate and accidentally going places mm-hmm. because of the suck tubes. Uh, that was a big problem for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and it puts you pretty far away. Um, yeah. In, in terms of like navigating the maze sometimes to get back to where you need to go. Uh, yeah. because of the suck tubes ain't fucking around them suck tubes the sucking nope. and fucking tubes <laughs> uh thanks everybody uh for writing in if you have things to say about october's or november's games hit us up at duckfeed.tv by the 15th of those respective months uh the october games are devotion strange land and the evil within of evil uh, within two rather evil within two thank you yes. I, yeah. uh do not sleep on devotion like uh, I, the, the rest of the month is all cool and stuff, but devotion is, does not take very long to play mm-hmm. and is a real contender in terms of like walking sim games. I think. Yeah. I liked the, it a lot. Devotion's a miracle. Yeah. Really, really <laughs> um, good. November's games. I'm excited about all of these. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're going to announce those now. Uh, they are Deus Ex mankind divided. Uh, that's yep. a Gary joint. Yeah. Um, Been wanting to talk about that for a while. Uh, the story is incomplete. And then mm-hmm. the, that studio shut down, but it is a great world to explore in terms yeah. of immersive simness. Lots of a, you, you called it a very, like one of the best break-in simulators. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The are. Prague is a real miracle uh, in yeah. how that's designed uh, mm-hmm. in that game. Uh, yeah. The second game is super hot. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I imagine that we're also going to brush on super hot VR and also mind control delete as well. Yep. Yeah, we we're, we don't do split episodes anymore, but we'll give those a tight five with the idea that in five years down the road, if we feel like talking about super hot VR, we still can. Well, yeah, and also, yeah. Uh, and you know, by that time, we will have um, uh, popped the cork on doing VR games because the premium episode for November is going to be Half Life Alex. Yes, yeah, um, a sponsored episode. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that episode is sponsored by Elliot. Uh, I'm excited. I have to figure out how to hook my Oculus up to Steam. It's easy. Apparently, yeah, apparently super easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have to get out and charge my Oculus. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I like, I, you know, I, I've gone on a real VR journey. Like I like it. Uh-huh. Um, I like it more than I thought I would. I had a lot of fun with it. I forget that it exists constantly mm-hmm. and it just sits in my closet. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to having, I've wanted to play Alex a lot. Uh, looking forward to that. I love the idea of going back to the half-life world. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited. I'm excited too. I've played, uh, like the first third of it and, um, yeah, like it is, it is wild to play a game that has that kind of shooting and exploration um, in uh, in VR. Fun puzzles too. Neat. Yeah. The uh, we have December uh, WRPG month just because I like when people guess this stuff. This is fun, coy boyness. <laughs> We're doing two <laughs> games uh, for that, and the premium episode will be another game. So if you people remember a couple of years ago, we did the Adventures of Lolo um, as that we had a month where it didn't make sense. Do you, to do yeah, a premium I was like, game? We, you can't do a premium episode about Tetris. <laughs> yeah, or or doing or, or of half a game. Right. Uh, the way this is working out, uh, just with time wise and stuff, and because we want to give Bethesda a rest and and Bioware a rest, um, is we're doing two games that are from different different devs. Uh, the premium, everyone will get all those episodes, but patrons at five dollars will get a whole bonus episode on something short we couldn't fit into a regular episode. Yep. Yeah. So that's a five episode waff. I know. It's big. Merry Christmas. Mm-hmm. Merry Christmas um, to all. Yeah. That's also, uh, we'll announce at some point, Duckstream as well. Mm-hmm. All that stuff's coming. Uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> um, and then we also have part of January planned uh, with patron demand so far, and it's cool shit. Mm-hmm. I'm, it's all stuff I'm excited to play. Yeah. So, uh, like we said, right in by the 15th of the respective months, if you have thoughts on any of those, please separate them into multiple responses. Um, if you have, uh, if you want to sponsor an episode, uh, you can go to, uh, patreon.com slash Doug V TV. Uh, we are taking those for next year, uh, at mm-hmm. this point. Uh, but, uh, the slots are there. Um, you know, to, to explain how that works, we, uh, ask you for a few different choices and then we work out, uh, what we're going to do. Uh, that way it is not just, uh, you know, first choice. Sorry, that's not going to work for us kind of deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, do, do so. We'll, we'll communicate to you. I'll reach out. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than that, just thanks everybody. We really appreciate you. Hope everybody's, Oh, uh, this is worth mentioning here too. Uh, we're not doing Portland retro gaming expo this year. Still not there quite yet with COVID stuff, like asking, you know, Cole to come on a plane and be in a hotel. And then we sit in a room with thousands of people, for a couple hours is too much. Not for a couple of hours. For yeah, a couple, a couple of days. Hours. A couple yeah. of days is what I meant. Yeah, like that's too much. Yeah. Uh, I am going to guest. There's a retronauts panel. I'm going to guest on uh, mm-hmm. on Saturday uh, in the morning. Okay. So uh, come check that out if you like. And then uh, me and my fiance are going to walk around the uh, the show floor a little bit. If you see me, say hi. Uh, but we're not doing a presence there. I'm really hoping for next year. Yeah. So yeah, I, I miss it so fucking bad me too so uh that's about it i think i think so thanks everybody got an extra long uh extra long dispatch this month um take it in good health we'll be back next week with uh devotion seriously uh go play devotion it's not on storefronts but you can buy it directly from the uh red candle website uh it is drm free and such runs on pc uh, r- really, it's, like, it's it's a running time of a movie. The reason why we're stressing this is because we want to spoil it and stuff. And yeah. we usually do that in the episode, but we're doing it now so you can be played up and then uh, listen to the episode. Yeah, it is. It is as close to like a uh, uh, just an unqualified recommendations as I would ever make in a game. So yeah, it's quite good. Yeah. Uh, good night, everybody. Good night.